And we are live. Hey everybody, this is Roberta Blake, helping you create something awesome today. Welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to be talking about how to build a successful YouTube channel. I'm going to be exposing some of the secrets of full-time content creators. If you're new here, my name is Roberta Blake. I try to do a live stream at least once a week and I post content whenever I can to help you become a better content creator and go full-time with this. My friend Nick Nimmin is not streaming today, so I decided I would fill in on a Saturday. So here we are. Let's go ahead and jump into everything. I've got my live stream set up here. Uh, definitely will be taking your super chats if anyone wants to do that. I'm also going to be chewing a lovely frosted lemonade. So that is what I'm going to be doing. But yeah, <clears throat> something I can tell you from long time experience of doing... Uh, 1,600 videos on this YouTube channel, almost to 600,000 subscribers is one thing I can definitely do is I can show you real analytics, break down the behind the scenes of a YouTube channel. And the, the other thing that I can do is I can also help you understand why some content creators are successful and others are not. Because I know it's something that people think is confusing and a lot of people attribute this wrongfully, in my opinion, to luck when actually... It really comes down to uh, math more than luck. And people use all kinds of weirdness to try to justify the stance on YouTube being luck. And and what they'll do is they'll they'll throw out things like survivorship bias. I don't think they actually understand the thing that they're talking about because they're not looking at the commonality patterns of success. Now, like I'm not going to completely say that survivorship bias doesn't exist. It's just that it's not really a thing that's indicative of success when we talk about being a content creator, because being a content creator is actually a profession. It's actual skills that you need to be a successful content creator. And the other thing is that people come up with subjective versions of being a successful content creator. And I kind of want to go against that. I actually um, do not want to attribute <clears throat> the subjective versions of being a successful content creator, because I don't think that it's actually helpful when you're talking about developing your career. If we talked about developing your career as a graphic designer, we would not use subjective measurements of being a successful graphic designer. If we talked about being successful as a full-time writer. We would not be dealing in subjective measurements of being a full-time writer. So why do we have subjective measurements, subjective feelings-based metrics for being a successful content creator on social media platforms like YouTube when we have an abundance of analytics to, to tell us. So I'm going to tell you what I define um, as a successful content creator through various levels of success, various levels of success when we're talking about um, building yourself out to be a career-based content creator. Because by the way, there is nothing wrong with being a hobby-based content creator, but we need to separate and differentiate between I'm a hobby-based content creator. I want to do what I want. I want to have fun and blah, blah, blah. Okay, great. You're, you're a hobbyist. There's no offense in saying you're not a serious content creator and you're not making the same commitments as someone who wants a career. It's no different than saying that you enjoy playing basketball versus you want to play for a team in the pro levels of the NBA and have a career. It's very different. Now, your odds are more obviously have better odds of being a content creator. But I make this point to say, if you want to be a successful content creator, one of the first things you should do is meet the monetization requirements for the platform that you're on. If it's YouTube, if it's YouTube specifically, you want to build a successful YouTube channel, meet the YouTube monetization requirements. So that is number one, meet the YouTube monetization requirements. And what happens is if you can meet the YouTube monetization requirements, you get to go into this section called earn. Excuse me, I got the sniffles a little bit. You get to go into the section called earn, and then there's multiple ways for YouTube to pay you out if you get monetized. So that means now when you're doing something, you're not really doing it purely in hobby mode. There's potential for you to earn. There's actual potential for you to earn. So that means that when you make content, there's a way for you to make money from ad revenue. And if you're doing live streaming, you can earn from super chats so you can get donation-based fan funding revenue. 
in either case, you can do memberships so you can be paid by people who want to support you on a regular basis. You can get sponsorships so you could work with brands. YouTube also has some internal tools for that called Brand Connect. You can sell directly to your audience with YouTube shopping, even though you don't need YouTube shopping to do that. And now if you do shorts, there's shorts feed ads. So that's another way for you to earn. So you have these different ways directly in the platform itself to monetize a YouTube channel. Technically, you have as many as nine ways directly in the platform to monetize a YouTube channel. But there are multiple ways to monetize a YouTube channel that go beyond that. And there's a lot of different ways of selling directly to your audience. You know, we could talk about that. But what I would say is your first level and first step to being a successful YouTuber, building a successful YouTube channel, is meet the YouTube monetization requirements. 1,000 subscribers and then either the monetization requirements being 4,000 hours of watch time or uh, 10 million views. You can get the 4,000 hours in 12 months or you can get 10 million shorts-based views in 90 days. I believe that the easiest thing to do out of those is just get the 4,000 hours in one year and make a plan around that. And I've talked a lot at length about how to do that. The basic formula for getting the watch hours for anybody concerned about that is if you make at least 100 videos in a year and you can average, it won't happen for every single video, but if the average across those videos is that by the end of a year, you can average to 100,000 views across all of the 100 videos or however many videos you make. I call it 100 because it makes the math a lot easier. It makes the math easier to math if you do it that way. So in fact, actually what I can do is I can bring up a, I can probably make this, wonder, I wonder if I, I wonder how big I can, um, I wonder if this will work. So what I, I could do is I could show, show you the math. Give me a second. I'm going to switch to a way to show you the math to do a calculation. If I can, we'll see how um, big I can get on the screen. I'm going to try to show you a math calculation to get the watch hours for YouTube. Okay. So if you can get 100,000 views on YouTube, yeah, 100,000, you can get 100,000 views on YouTube. Is that the right amount of zeros? Just make sure. Yeah. You get 100,000 views on YouTube, right? And you know you have to get um, 4,000 watch hours. You need to be able to average three minutes average view duration across those videos because that's going to give you 300,000 hours of watch. Uh, sorry, 300,000 minutes of watch time. 300,000 minutes of watch time divided by 60 to get that down will give you more than enough. You'll be more than enough because the 4,000 hours, minutes is an hour, you need 240,000. You need 240,000 minutes. You need 240,000 minutes, right? If you can get an average view duration of three minutes across 100,000 views on YouTube, you get 300,000 minutes. So you're going to be well over the amount you need. And the reason you need to be over the amount, the reason you need to be over the amount is because then you have a margin of error because it's possible that not every video will be considered eligible watch minutes. So this means you pass the threshold of safety. You pass the threshold of safety. Now, retention rates on YouTube are really difficult. Retention rates on YouTube are really difficult. So the thing is, if you make a, let's say 12 minute video on average, but you can only get 30% retention rates, then that means that you're just going to barely cross the three minute threshold there. So that's what I would shoot for. I would shoot knowing that you probably are only going to get 30% retention if you're a small YouTuber because you don't necessarily have the skills to retain people long on your videos. I would do this and I would say, okay, I'm going to try to average my videos between 10 and 12 minutes, maybe nine in between nine and 12 minutes. And if I make videos between nine and 12 minutes and then I, um, throughout the course of a year, can accumulate 100,000 views with that kind of average view duration. I know that I've met the requirements in terms of the minutes watched required 
to get monetized on YouTube. So watch time, that's pretty straightforward. The other reason we're doing 100,000 views is because if we just can convert 1% of those people, we have our 1,000 subscribers. So that's the formula that I use to get YouTubers monetized. The formula that I use to get YouTubers monetized is we make 100 very intentional videos. We make 100 intentional videos. We plan it out. We try to stick to one audience for those videos so that we can milk the most out of it. So we get we stick to one audience. We make 100 videos in a year for one audience. This is what's like difference between a hobby creator who hopes to blow up one day and a career creator that's like, I'm going to build a successful channel brick by brick, right? Is we build a system for our success. So we go ahead and this is basically the study guide. This is just like any career. You want to be a graphic designer. You want to be a, a architect. You want to be a web designer. You want to be a photographer. You, you, you really don't leave anything to chance. And it's not really about how creatively talented you are. It's really about building systems for your career and building up your career and knowing what the minimum requirements are and what you have to do to be successful in your career field by objective measurements and by objective things that you can do. Okay. So um, it's easier to do this with a podcast. I actually got my podcast monetized with one month of effort. I got a, I got a podcast channel. And I monetized it with a month of effort because the average view duration on a podcast is so much higher that it was so much easier to do. So I did it with like maybe 25 to 30 uploads, but that's because the watch time amount and the average view duration was so astronomically high that I was able to do that. So it makes a difference. Um, so again, like just picking one lane to stay in, at least at the beginning of your career, so that you can meet the monetization requirements. You know that's going to be effective, and you know, okay, I'm making 100 videos very intentionally. I'm going to convert 1% of them over to being subscribers because I focused on one audience, so then my conversion rate is better. Okay. And, and if you want like a, another, like, you know, just kind of like um, proof of concept of conversion rates. Um, I've done this on my smaller channels, but I can show you this here. 1% rule is real. And the reason the 1% rule is real is because even at a higher um, level, 1% of viewer conversion to subscribers still seems to be uh, the norm when you're not doing YouTube shorts, when you're not doing YouTube shorts, because even on my channel, even on my channel, if I go to analytics, if I go to analytics, even on my channel, roughly 400,000 views turns into about 4K subscribers. You can see it right there with your eyes. So like what I get for 400,000 views is I get 4,000 subscribers and about $4,000 in YouTube monetization revenue. That's how it's worked. And, and that tends to be true. Even for smaller channels, it tends to be true as well that 1% of viewers turn into subscribers. The goal, though, is it works when you're speaking mostly to one audience. Now, if your personality is fire, that number can be much higher as far as a conversion ratio. I can get higher conversion ratios than that sometimes. Uh, but really, this is par for the course, right? This is why I tell you that if you can get 100,000 views, you can get the 1,000 subscriber requirement. And this works even on small channels. I've seen it time and time again. And it's even worked on some of my own small side channels. Okay. Even my faceless channel. So there, you know, there's kind of like a, a proof of concept for you. And there's some data and some evidence. And this, this generally tends to be true, even up to a hundred thousand subscribers. This tends to be the case. Most people, if they hit a hundred thousand subscribers and they're not doing YouTube shorts, you can look at their channel. They have 10 million views. They have 10 million views. I did at 8 million views actually. I got to 100,000 subscribers at about roughly 8 million views. So that this is what I'm talking about. Now, so, so there's a system that you could use to reach level one success. Hey, what's up, Justin Brown? Good to see you, my friend. So yeah, so that first level of success of just getting your channel monetized, if you're struggling with 1,000 subscribers, 4,000 hours of watch time, you can literally use the formula that I outline and you can use simple math and you can use simple math and you can actually get to that purely on simple math alone and get the monetization requirements. So then the next thing is that um, 
90% of channels never get to 10,000 subscribers. 90% of channels never get to 10,000 subscribers. What you would want to do, what you would want to do after you get your first 1,000 subscribers is you want to try to identify videos that performed better and you want to duplicate that in terms of the effort for your videos. Because if you go into advanced analytics, which none of you like to do, um, you have to go to analytics on your desktop. You guys need to stop just going to analytics on your smartphone. You need to go to analytics on your desktop. And then you need to look at advanced mode. You need to look at uh, content by subscribers. And then when you look at content by subscribers, if you want to grow your channel, and you say, okay, it took you a year to get, <clears throat> it took you a year to get a thousand subscribers. You don't want to grow by a thousand subscribers a year. Let's say you want to grow by a thousand subscribers a month. Well, then you have to start doing the things to grow by a thousand subscribers a month. And you need to identify them. So the way you would identify them is you would look at, well, what's growing me by subscribers? And you would start looking at your last 28 days. You'd look at your last 90 days and you'd say, okay, if I look at what topics, grow me by subscribers the most, then I need to focus on doing more of those topics. And that sounds like, a, oh, of course, Roberto, well, duh, but no, not really. Because you need to take even just one video. You need to take even just one video that got you like a thousand subscribers in a 30 to 90 day period. And then you need to reverse engineer that and say, how do I make a series of five more videos specifically, five more videos on one video that got me that, and then you could look at the other videos that got you either a lot of views or a lot of subscribers and go, okay. And then you also need to look at like proportions. You need to look at, well, did something get me a lot of subscribers, but with less views? And then, okay, what are those ratios looking like? Because then you could say, okay, if I can give more views to these kind of topics, or this is a, this converts higher at a higher percentage, but it got less views. How can I improve this to get more views specifically? And then if I can get more views, I can then turn those into subscribers. We've got YouTube's creator liaison, my good friend Renee Ritchie in the house, says, preach those advanced analytics, so valuable for creators. It really is. It really is. Um, and again, what's hurting a lot of you, and I hate to break it to you, a lot of you, what's hurting your channel is your own boredom. What's hurting your YouTube channel is your own boredom. I'm going to um, jump out analytics real quick because I got to address this. Do you know what ruins people's careers, ruins people's um, ruins people's careers, ruins people's business, ruins people's relationships, and then definitely ruins their YouTube channels? I can tell you. Boredom. Boredom and how you're reacting to, oh, I'm bored, so I'm going to just change things up. You're ruining your career and you're ruining your YouTube channel and a lot of you ruin your relationships because you decide, oh, I got bored and now I'm going to do something else. I'm going to introduce this chaos and chaos is not cute, my friends. Chaos is not cute. You're just ruining a good thing for no reason. And what a lot of you should do is you should embrace the fact that success until you reach a certain escape velocity, until you reach escape velocity, all success is predicated on being bored and doing boring things that work, boring things that work. And I'm not telling you do things you don't like. I'm not telling you do things you don't like. I'm telling you that you have to suffer through sometimes not having novelty, not being a variety channel, not being able to make whatever you want. It's that success comes in serving the audience and creators who put the audience above being bored will be more successful than a creator who does whatever the hell they want and then gets upset because it didn't work. You have to do things that work, and things that work start very boring. You know what's boring? Learning to tie your shoes is boring. Learning to read is burning. boring. Learning arithmetic is boring, okay? It's like the foundations of a successful career, a successful life, all of your successful relationships, your business relationships, your interpersonal relationships, it's going to be boring, mundane things. It's going to be maintenance. It's going to be maintenance mode. It's going to be building things brick by brick, and it's going to be maintenance mode. So it means if something worked, I need to do five more of that, 10 more of that to get five to 10 more times the result out of it. It's just what you're going to have to do. So you can just start to try to find ways to say, okay, now creativity can come in the execution of the way that you do it. Do the thing that works 
but then try to keep all the successful parts of that process, but make it enjoyable enough to endure it or to get excited about it. I will give you a primary example. So this video is about a uh, content strategy and it has a couple of components here. Use the strategy to grow on YouTube in 2023 advice for new YouTubers. Okay. I actually could probably use the same title formula a little bit differently a couple of times. I could probably make a use the strategy to grow a YouTube channel fast advice for small YouTubers because that's slightly different. And then I can make a effective thumbnail. I know I'm good at thumbnails. And then that one sp speaks to small YouTubers instead of just, just new YouTubers. It could probably have similar results. So that's one more way for me to duplicate this. Another video about content strategy is like, use this strategy to grow on YouTube. Advice for YouTubers with a full-time job. That's probably the majority of YouTubers. That's probably going to be really helpful. Use this advice to get monetized on YouTube. How to get 4,000 watch hours fast. Use this advice to get monetized on YouTube. How to get 1,000 subscribers fast. So now I probably have five videos that I could make that I know have the potential in a 90-day period to do very well. But like I made this video, how long ago did I make this video? Yeah, I made this video in the last 90 days. So I know that it's like, okay, if I make five more videos like this, then I probably can get another 8,000 subscribers from doing five videos. That's probably a really good idea, right? So it, it's just about um, using the data that you have and realizing that there is a reason that things work and that the, you have to, a YouTuber grows by putting the audience first. This is supply and demand. You have to supply what the audience demands. Thank you, Patricia Hairstyles for the super sticker. And thank you, One, for the super chat. Appreciate you, 999 super chat. We have more than one channel. We don't have to stick to one that we could run a couple of channels. In theory, you can, but here's my problem with people doing that because they're bored. Because this is like, and this is no offense to anybody, but this is the problem also with people being bored. See, if you're not a full-time content creator already, you probably shouldn't run more than one YouTube channel. If you're not a full-time, I need to make a video about this actually, about when to start a second YouTube channel. Do not start a second YouTube channel if you're not a full-time creator. If you're bored, get over it and make one channel work. Get one channel monetized. Get that channel to make $1,000 a month for you and then start from there. And then once that's working and everything like that, if you're bored, play video games. If you're bored, do TikTok. If you're bored, do Instagram. Don't start a second YouTube channel if you're not a full-time content creator because you're bored or because they're like you, you want to do different things. You're tired of doing the same thing over and over again. When you pick something for YouTube, pick something you're not going to get tired of. Pick something you're not going to get tired of. This is real advice. I'm just giving you real advice. It's harsh. A lot of people won't agree with it. They'll cherry pick exceptions versus the rule. I'm telling you, just like, you know, unfortunately in the real world, if you wanted to do a career, a profession, I would tell you if you're going to pick a college major, pick something you actually want to do potentially for the rest of your life. Do not change majors halfway through because you'll have to start over from scratch and you're going to do that because you're bored. If you're going to commit to something, try to get it right the first time. Now, not everyone will get it right the first time. Sudden's Day says, excellent message today. Um, thank you for keeping it real. If you don't feel the first video, if you feel the first channel isn't succeeding and you've made like 100, 150 videos, scrap it, do a second channel, and don't go back to the first channel. If you feel like the first channel isn't working and you think you can do better on a second channel, go all in on the second channel and don't touch the first channel ever again. And I'm dead serious. I'm dead serious. Because again, if you're a career creator, if you're a career creator, if you're a hobby creator, disregard all my advice and do what the hell you want. My advice, I'm, I want to like caveat this stream. I want to caveat the stream. My advice is only in this instance for people who want to be full-time content creators. 
if you want to do YouTube for fun, turn off the stream. I'm serious because my advice is not going to be helpful to people who want to do YouTube for a hobby and want to do YouTube for fun. That is not how my advice works. My advice is not really geared toward the hobbyist. My advice is geared toward people who want this to either be a $1,000 a month plus side hustle or who want to go full time and are going to commit to it. And my advice is for people who largely at least have some stable, some stable lifestyle. And my advice is for people who have a stable lifestyle. And I think anyone can read between the lines and know what that means. So if you exist outside those circumstances, my advice is not for you. And I don't like having to qualify my advice with 20 asterisks and disclaimers, but I think I have to be very clear because one of the biggest problems in social media is the concept of generalized advice. I understand that problem, but that's also how everything works is we, we speak in general terms and in generalities, and we have to because we end up niching down to the point of non-existence if we don't at least to some extent speak in broad sweeping terms or generalizations. But I will give you my caveats. My caveats is if you don't have a stable home situation and a stable lifestyle, and if you're trying to do YouTube for fun and for a hobby, do not go with my advice. Find somebody who focuses on that type of advice because it's not me. My advice is for people who want to be full-time content creators and do it as a career or who want to do a $1,000 a month side hustle and will treat it like a part-time job and will treat it like a part-time job instead of treating it like I want to play my favorite video game and get paid for it. I want to vlog my life and get paid for it. That's not my advice. My advice doesn't work for those people. My advice is not for people whose first priority, second priority, or third priority is having fun. That's also because I'm 38. I'm like, so I'm, I'm older. I'm like, I'm over the hill. Like I'm not, I'm, it's not a first, second or third priority for me. The priority goes to making the most out of your time, getting the most ROI out of your time, min maxing, meaning that my advice is for you to get the most out of that camera gear and to be able to pay back the camera gear that you bought, pay that off, especially those of you who, for whatever reason, put it on a credit card instead of just buying it. Like, I want you to pay that thing off or I want you to, you know, turn this into something to where you can justify it to yourself. You can justify it to your friends and family and say, hey, it's, uh, I'm making $1,000 a month. This is not a waste of my time. This is a priority in my life for a reason. Because I mean, that part's really hard, right? Like if something's not making money and it's taking time away from other people in your life, it's hard to justify it to yourself and to other people, um, especially those people that it may come at the expense of spending time with, right? So if, if you have people that you're not spending time with to make content creation, kind of hard to justify it sometimes if you can't say that it's making a return. So- there's so that's you know that's the issue um and the thing is you can be creative and you can express yourself and you can have adhd but that that doesn't eliminate the priority of focus because the 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 issue is going to be that you cannot use adhd as a reason or an excuse for your employer of why you did something outside of the manual or outside of the box when you were supposed to follow instructions step by step for the company to meet its goals. You're not going to have the excuse at work. Your boss isn't going to have that. Teachers aren't going to have that. Um, teachers are not very lenient on that sort of thing. And for producing real world resorts, like the world doesn't owe any of us understanding. And that's a harsh thing to come to a realization of. The audience doesn't know you understanding. It's hard. So the th way that you address it is you package up front and give people what they want. And if you want to have fun, or you want to tweak your, you know, your brain or whatever, do it in the editing. If you're going to do anything, do it in the editing, but do it in the editing in like the middle of the video, not in the first 30 seconds of the video. You everything that's up front has to serve the audience and put the audience first. So the topic title and thumbnail, that has to be about the audience, not about you. The hook in the video in that first 30 seconds, that first 30 seconds, that first one third of the video, that has to be about the audience, not about you. And then whatever thing is going to satisfy you, that can be in the middle of a video. You want to do a little fun skit? You can do that in the middle of a video. You want to do a quirky edit thing that you just learned because it'd be cool or a thing that you think would look good? You can do that in the middle of the video because at least you have the first one third and the audience might be able to feel like they got some value. 
You have to put the audience first. So, you know, the, 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 there's all these excuses and distractions that are going to hurt your career as a content creator. And you have to be ruthless about this. You know what they say in writing? In writing, they say, kill your darlings. In writing and editing, they say, kill your dollar, darlings. And what this is, is like, there might be a part of the book or the story that you were really attached to that just disconnects the reader or pulls them out of the story. And you have to be willing to get rid of that thing. You have to be willing to kill your darlings for the sake of a better story, for the sake of the reader. And a content creator has to do the same ruthless choices for the benefit of their viewers, for the benefit of the viewers. They have to create the ex best experience for the viewer. Because if you don't serve the audience, if you don't serve your audience, somebody else will come along and do it. If you don't serve your audience, somebody will. Somebody will, and they'll be happy to run their numbers up and they'll say, I don't care. I'll be bored. I'll do the thing. Cause that what they'll say is they'll say, well, I want that silver play button or I want to make 10, $20,000 a month. So what the audience wants is what the audience gets. Someone will serve the audience if you don't. And then you'll sit there and you'll be like satisfying yourself and you'll be an audience of one or, or even if you're not an audience of one, you'll be an audience of 100 and it'll be a hundred and maybe they're ride or die. And that, if that's enough for you, that's fine. That's what being a hobby creator can look like. And I have nothing against people being a hobby creator. But I'm saying if you can't commit, then it's not a career. If you can't commit to things, then it's not a career. It's a hobby. Because careers are commitments. Careers are often decade-long commitments, lifelong commitments. If you can't even stick with one thing for a year, do you think that you're going to be able to stick with one thing for a decade just because it takes off? This is why people who go viral with one video can't sustain it, by the way. Everyone wants to go viral. Viral creators often aren't able to sustain it because they don't want to do the thing that succeeded. And sometimes that's a good idea because sometimes they succeed doing things that are embarrassing or that can't be duplicated. And they live in the shadow of their viral video. They were one hit wonder. Going viral is not the blessing that people pretend it is a lot of times because most people can't sustain it because it's not the thing that would make them happy. They have no ability to emotionally sustain doing that content. And guess what? Someone will come along who can. We'll see that that's a viral trend. And then that's why someone who starts the trend doesn't benefit as much as somebody who takes over the trend. And that can happen. So Chloe Forbes says uh, $5 or five euro super chat. Is it possible to become a full-time content creator on YouTube alone? Or do you think we need other social media platforms too? Largely, most people don't use other social media platforms to grow their YouTube channel. Uh, there, um, and a lot of times, the other social media platforms can be a distraction to your YouTube channel. But other social media platforms can help you with brand deals to become a full-time content creator. So I'm going to tell you some things that you don't know about full-time content creators. I'm going to tell you a couple of things you don't know about full-time content creators. Um, in fact, actually, what I'll let you do is if people want to super chat and then tell me who uh, a favorite full-time content creator. And this needs to be a full-time content creator. So don't super chat your own channel if you're not a full-time content creator. But if someone wants to super chat like over $10, I will analyze the full-time content creator of your choice. And I will tell you things that made them successful that you may have overlooked and not understand. And I will break down their success for you. Um, my caveat on this is no one's allowed to pick Mr. Beast. No one's allowed to pick Mr. Beast. I will break down and analyze the success of whatever content creator you want. It's just not allowed to be Mr. Beast. It's also not allowed to be anybody who's not currently uploading videos. So, yes, you can become a full-time content creator alone. In fact, it might be more financially viable to become a full-time content creator alone because if you... Depending on your situation, if you're single, it's uh, it's easier financially to become full-time because you can live very modest. You can live very modest. You can become a full-time content creator. You can make three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 a month, live somewhere that's not New York and California, and you could do it strictly on YouTube. You don't need other platforms, but you also wouldn't need a team. I actually have several videos that I have planned this year that are specifically about being a solo content creator and not hiring a team. What a lot of you probably don't know is the 1600 videos on my channel. I edit my own videos still. I still do not have any type of video editor helping me. I do all the videos. I do all the thumbnails. I do all the production for the live streams. I'm doing all of it. I have um, you know, a team helping me in my coaching business, but that's it. Team helps me on my coaching business and that's it. Um, but but yeah, you, you have to pick something. 
and and by, by you have to pick something, I, you have to pick an audience. You you really have to pick an audience. So when I say niche down, I'm not really talking about niching down to a topic. I'm talking about saying this is the group of people that I'm passionate about making things for, and I'm going to care about what they want and what they pay attention to and what matters to them, and I'm going to make them happy. I'm going to make this group of people happy. That's what it really is. We used to just call that target marketing. Um, we used to just call that target marketing in business. So, yeah. Um, Terraman says, yep, when I play live music, I put the audience first. Yeah, you have to. You have to. You have to put the audience first. You absolutely have to put the audience first because the thing is, there's nothing that happens without the audience, right? So the audience has to be priority and focus. And when you look at things, it's easier to look, it's easy to look at things through the lens of being a content creator versus looking at things through the lens of the audience and what they want and the fact that it's their time. It's their time. And so I think I think that that matters. Yeah, you can have different playlists. But your the topics you're you're building are entirely too separated, right? So um, you're saying that you want to build different playlist topics like finance, music, career, and food. That will confuse not just the algorithm. That confuses a viewer. That confuses a viewer completely. Um, we're not looking for that. Can there's not a TV show that you're watching? There's not a TV show that you're watching for all of those topics. You see what I'm saying? You're, there's not one TV show that you're watching that does all of those things. So, I wouldn't I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. The reason like find a solution that you're solving for these women. A solution that's meaningful to the, the one of the most important things you could do for these women is focus on finance and career. You can focus on finance and career because those two things are intrinsic to um, success and independence and economic mobility. So finance and career. Now, those things are extraordinarily similar, but they solve for a, 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 enough of the same type of circumstances and problems that those people would have that allows them to watch every video that you would upload. Okay? So – diversifying you don't need to diversify much more than finance and career to be honest with you you don't need to diversify much more than finance and career because finance has like maybe five different product buckets in it you could be finance great finance is also financial literacy finance is also investing so you could teach them that so you could teach them financial literacy. You could teach them investing. You could teach them budgeting. You could teach them um, credit hacking and, and things of that nature. You could teach personal finance. Those are five buckets under finance by itself. Then in career, okay, career development. You could teach salary negotiation and salary negotiation role, role play, okay? You could teach career building and career spills, skills. You could do list of high-paying careers, Okay, you could do things on switching uh, careers. You could do things on job placement or or things of that nature, or when to leave your career, when to transition, what you should be paid, salary transparency. You have literally you have ten content buckets. If all you taught these women were finance and career development, and that's enough to consolidate an audience. And the thing is, that's a more important priority to them than music or food. Music and food are distractions. Finance and career are intrinsic to a better life for them. And so why not make that a priority and say the specific problem I have, because guess what? If they have their career in order and they have work-life balance, and if they have their finances in order, they make enough money, they have enough security, they have enough stability, they can go to music festivals all they want and they can buy whatever food they want. They could travel the world and try whatever food they want to try because they can afford it at that point. So again, when we want to make all these different topics and we want to be variety channels, what we're really doing is there's an intrinsic, 
there's an intrinsic selfish component to variety content and like, oh, I have all these interests and it has nothing to do what's in the best interest of the audience. You may have noticed I, I've i positioned the channel. In fact, actually, I mean, we can even look at this because I can just show you why I'm doing certain things I'm doing and I can explain what the future of this channel is and that actually might be helpful just for you to get perspective because there's, there's a lot of things I want to do, but I'm also a full-time content creator. So guess what? That means that when I want an outlet, I can just, I can do my podcast. I can do another YouTube channel. I can do a faceless YouTube channel. I can do different things because I'm a full-time content creator and that gives me, and I don't have, you know, kids or anything. So I, I can just like, I can put time and money and effort into things that a normal person may not be able to because I have a circumstance that's different, right? So what I'm going to show you is, hang on. I'm going to switch screens real quick. I'm going to bring up a screen. I'm going to show you um, why I changed like the main content buckets for my channel. Um, ah, here it is. I'm going to show you why I changed the main content buckets for my channel, what I changed them to, and why it makes sense for what I'm building out. And maybe this will help you understand because there's a way to address variety should exist in the guise of how you solve for a problem, not the problem that you solve per se, or again, the audience you solve the problem for. It could be the things that are meaningful to that group of people. It could be the things that's meaningful to that group of people. Now, again, this is easier to parse in your head if you're doing education stuff, but if you're doing entertainment, you absolutely should niche down too if you're doing entertainment. And by that, I mean you should niche down kind of to a mission statement or a style or a thing that you're doing. So that's a little bit more about style and brand building in a way. And again, I can, I can, I can, you can pick creators and I can tell you how they're doing it and I can make, use them as an example, but um, always be booked cruise and travel says, appreciate the straightforwardness. Keep telling, uh, uh, keep telling us how it is. Uh, I will. Um, so on my channel, creators and business, Profit from your passion in the creator economy, okay? So when you go to the, the playlist that are featured on my channel, content creators who want to be full-time are building an online business. If you're trying to be a full-time content creator, essentially you're trying to build an online business, whether you realize it or not, because that's how you're making your money. The best platform for building your brand and audience online in terms of social media platforms or media platforms is going to be YouTube as far as I'm concerned. And it's the one that I have the expertise and experience in to the, to the most degree, followed by, I would say, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn for me. Because I have almost 100,000 followers on Twitter. I have like um, 70, almost 75,000 followers on Twitter. I'll be at 100,000 by the end of next year on Twitter. So I can speak to that, but YouTube is the one that pays people. So it's probably the best one as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Then if you're going to be a full-time content creator, how do most full-time content creators make their money? Brand deals. So, oh, it makes sense that I have a playlist on brand deals, right? Well, to make content, you have to edit. So it makes sense that I teach you how to properly edit your content and use editing tools and editing software and that those are super evergreen videos and they're tutorials. So, okay, well, that makes sense. We'll start here to learn how to create content. So being confident on camera, you kind of have to do that to be successful. Making thumbnails, you kind of have to do that to be successful on YouTube. Uh, batching content, making the right amount of content, you have to do that to be successful. Oh, content strategy, it makes sense that I would want to teach you about content strategy is uploading more helping you, niching down, use this strategy, um, no BS advice, how to get discovered. That makes sense. How to monetize. Okay, making content doesn't really matter if you can't make money off of it in some way, shape, or form. So giving you different ways to monetize, different niches that pay better, how much each niche pays, um, how to turn that income into passive income probably makes sense. Oh, you're on social media. You probably do need to understand how to properly build your personal brand and how to position that. Um, understanding the creator economy, understanding analytics, being a full-time content creator probably matters to you. Managing your mental health as a content creator, probably important, um, or at least it should be, may not seem important enough for the views that I get whenever I cover that particular topic. 
uh, since it seems to struggle to break 20K views on that topic whenever I talk about creators' mental health. Uh, people say it matters to them. Does it, though? Seems to me that monetizing and getting subscribers matters a lot more to creators than their mental health. Seems like um, that matters to people more than learning how to edit videos fast, which would probably make them more successful. Um, brand deals seems to be doing well because people do want to get brand deals, but a lot of people don't qualify for them. So growth on YouTube and making money seem to be the two priorities for people. So again, that's why those things are the top of the uh, playlist that I put out there. So if you look at this, everything I describe shows you how I put the audience first. I'm like, okay, if these things get the most views, these things are the most interesting to people in aggregate repeatedly, and I can prove it with numbers. And hey, I know this is the money side that makes people successful. I know that time matters and video editing is hard. And I know content strategy is hard to grasp and that making money is absolutely essential and that personal branding is evergreen and always matters, then these other things become like a lesser priority. Okay, I put things in the order that the audience basically dictated the order for. So you can kind of see why that makes sense. And that like, okay, Roberto's answer to putting the audience first was figuring out that people care about um, money, time, and attention. Maybe not in that order, but to some degree. So like money, time, and attention. Or you could argue because of subscriber growth that people care about subscribers because of status. Views are a utility for them, but I don't really focus on views. I focus on money because money is more of a utility. Views are a means to an end of getting that utility. So they go hand in hand. Subscribers are status. Money is valuable and utility. And that time is essential to the process of accomplishing either of those things. So where's the time drain for creators? Video editing is the time drain for creators. What's the motivation for creators? Monetization because of what money does for you. Money is a tool, so utility. Or subscribers because of status. So subscribers is status. Monetization is utility. Those are people's end game. A process for attaining that is, well, I need to be able to edit faster and I'd be able to make the right content. So video editing and content strategy. Well, what's the monetization method that people think is the most obscure in terms of details, brand deals and sponsorships. What's the methodology for which people would like their money to be made? They would like to make it as passive as possible. Why? So they could get more time back to either make better content or enjoy their lives. Everything I did is strategic. And so you can see that that was like a strategic take on how to put the audience first how to execute that in terms of content strategy and that my channel is not as much of a variety channel as it would seem. It has some of the same struggles as a variety channel, but what's the goal here? Help content creators accomplish their goals of either making side income, going full time or reaching the levels of status that they want to achieve in terms of their subscriber goals. Very straightforward. Do I help you get more subscribers? Do I help you get more money? Do I help you make content better and more effective? Very straightforward. Um, Roberto, your book is awesome. First book in my YouTube book club. Thank you. The book he's talking about is called, thank you, JT, uh, Coin Rings for that. It's Create Something Awesome, How Creators Are Profiting from Their Passion in the Creator Economy. You can buy it on Amazon. I should have a link in the description. If not, I'll add it, but... Definitely uh, a great book. Amazon bestseller. Very proud of it. Uh, if you've read the book, please give it a five-star rating and review to help me win the Amazon algorithm and not just the YouTube algorithm. So it's available on Amazon. For those of you who can't afford the book at all, it can be ordered through your public library. Can be ordered through your public library. Uh, Jenny Lay says, I appreciate all the time you put into helping us. Absolutely. No, my pleasure. No problem. Let's see. Um, oh, we have one I can uh, definitely break down. Um, this is this actually really, I can tell you what this person is doing successfully. Um, to, uh, Monkey D. Wade says, break down totally. Not Mark, he's an anime tuber that inspired me. Yeah, I can do that. I'm familiar with Mark's content anyway. So that's actually not that bad. Um, 
Totally not Mark. I can tell you a liability of totally not Mark's. Totally not Mark makes a lot of content in the anime community that's vulnerable copyright claims and copyright strikes because he covers a lot of properties that are owned by um, Toei Animation and Suecia, respectively. And he's at um, 788,000 subscribers. So he's almost at 800,000 subscribers. But totally not Mark. I like his channel. Um, I like what he's doing. I have nothing against fair use content creators, but his um, content is extremely vulnerable. And he's had an issue that required like rallying the whole YouTube community behind him because he's very vulnerable to uh, copyright claims from Toei Animation and Suecia. And since they're foreign copyright holders and the Japanese uh, companies are much more traditional, much more conservative, and they don't do this whole sharing IP economy, they, they're not really about that life. <laughs> um, it makes them extremely vulnerable. He's had issues with that in the past. Um, his answer to it has been to try to expand to cover more content in popular properties that exist outside of Toei Animation and Suecia because they're really bad about copyright claims even and fair use they don't care about fair use and there's nothing to protect and guarantee fair use and fair dealing in um japan and there are videos he's taken down uh because of that so totally not mark what he does that's very smart is totally not mark leans into existing properties that are very popular that have high demand so he's not guessing if you want to know, oh, why is he successful? Because he's not guessing. He knows what his audience likes. He knows what his audience wants. He knows what his audience cares about. So that's one part of it. The other thing he does is he created something he's known for. These blind reviews. These blind reviews are something he's known for. So one of the other benefits he gets algorithmically is algorithmically he gets to um, use these content buckets for a series of a blind review like Bleach, for example. And he gets to use very similar uh, topic title thumbnail and they're binge worthy. So you can sit there and you can watch these. He makes extremely long form content for the algorithm and that benefits a lot. It's something you can play in the background. It's something people might even watch more than one time. It's binge worthy by covering multiple series. He also has the ability to get multiple different types of people in a lot of people who watch these same series also um, crossover and watch the other series, maybe not a hundred percent of the community, but there's enough crossover. So he has things that he's known for. And then he has these redrawing like series. So he has his own series that are branded that he's known for. He's using well-known intellectual property that has large audiences that are guaranteed guaranteed because it has a fandom. So he's tapping into that. Here's the video where he talks about like, you know, um, beating the copyright situation with Toei Animation. So, and then again, he has tremendous thumbnails. Totally not Mark's thumbnails are always a five out of five. His thumbnails are always a five out of five. Look at these. Uh, of any video that you watch on the same thing, his thumbnail is going to be better. His thumbnail is going to be better. His video is probably going to be longer. So those are all in his favor. And he has something he's known for. And it has binge worthiness built into it. And it's done at a high level of quality on top of all of that. So if you want, that's why totally not Mark is successful. So I hope you appreciate that breakdown since that's the creator that inspired you. He has his own series that he's known for. He has multiple series that he's known for. They're binge worthy, binge watchable series. He taps into intellectual property that's well known, which is an obvious one. But he also has superior thumbnails on top of very high quality. And obviously, he's beloved by the community. He has a great personality. So that kind of helps. Um, through a glass darkly says, based on the economics, I don't see how someone could afford a team on beneath 100 subscribers. Uh, they could if their business model exists outside of ad revenue. And it's actually very easy for your business to exist out, outside of ad revenue. Someone can afford a team. Let's say that somebody is a photographer or filmmaker and they have 50,000 subscribers. If that photographer or filmmaker has 50,000 subscribers, let's say they um, do three videos a week 
and they average 10K views on every upload because they have 50,000 subscribers. That person can afford a team. And I know this because of uh, creators like Jared Poland, for example. This person can afford a team. And actually, one of the reasons um, that this could work is because if they get 10,000 views per upload, but they're a photographer, but they sell something like a $100 course that makes you a better photographer, like Jared Poland did with Frodo's photo, right? They sell you a $100 course that helps you improve flash photography. And then they have a $100 course that helps you um, get out of auto and stop using auto on your camera, auto settings, and you get to learn how to use the manual settings. Now those are two programs you can buy for $100. That means that the LTV of their customer, lifetime value of their customer is at least $200. If they get 10,000 views, there's a good chance that they get 10 people to buy that product. So that means every time they upload, they're getting 10 people to buy those two products on average. They're getting those sales. They're making $1,000 to $2,000 per upload. They're uploading three times a week. They're making $3,000 in sales rather than ad revenue because they have a product built in and that's per week. So that means that they're already making over 10K a month. If they live somewhere that's not New York or California and they're living very modestly and we're not even counting ad revenue, but we already know that they're in the photo niche like this and they're probably getting good views. They're probably making two, 3,000, even with 50K uh, subscribers, they're making probably 3,000 or more into ad revenue alone in ad revenue. So on ad revenue alone, they could probably pay for a part-time or full-time person to help them with a photography channel pretty pretty easily actually depending on what the gig is okay especially if they don't live in new york or california that's pretty straightforward someone would much rather take thirty thousand dollars a year working for them than working at a company they don't like um and being able to do that and be able to play with camera gear all day easy 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 win there okay so then they have the three thousand ad revenue and then they're making about probably two thousand three thousand a week in sales they have more than enough money to live off of, plus have one team member. And then if that's helping them grow and they eventually are able to grow beyond that, it's not going to be that difficult to get another the team member. And if it's a photography channel, well, when you buy a really good camera lens, it's a $90 commission on Amazon if someone buys a really good camera lens. If they buy a beginner camera, if they buy a beginner camera, it's $20 commission on Amazon. So I could definitely see them making more if they're getting 10,000 views and upload in their photography exclusive channel, they're probably getting a bunch of clips through those Amazon stuff. So they probably are making at that point a good $500 a week on Amazon affiliate at 50,000 subscribers on a photography dedicated channel. It's getting 10,000 views and upload even with 50,000 subscribers. So again, at 200 to 500 a week, let's say it's 500 a week on the Amazon affiliate. Well, that's another $2,000 a month. So they definitely got time, money to have at least two part-time employees that might be time part-time still make a good living between these three monetization methods because they're not living on AdSense. They have Amazon affiliate. They have their own um, course program that's very cheap for their audience. And then they have their ad revenue. If they have even one recurring monthly sponsor and at that level, they could get a $2,000 a month recurring sponsor or $1,000 a month recurring sponsor, then they definitely have another good piece of their monetization mix right then and there. So yes, at 50,000 subscribers in the right niche for the right channel, you could have two part-time employees or one full-time employee based on the economics because you're not, it's ad revenue is not the game y'all like ad revenue isn't Jack for a lot of channels. Ad revenue is not what makes channels rich. I'll tell you this. My ad revenue is pretty good. I'm going to make like 40, $50,000 a year, probably on YouTube revenue this year, but that's a pales in comparison comparison to the hundred thousand. I'm probably going to make on brand deals. It pales in comparison. I don't even sell a course yet. And I know I'm going to do $100,000 a year in coaching. I know that I'm going to do $80,000 minimum in affiliate. So as much as I love, 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 love the $40,000, $50,000 a year, that's enough to hire a, a full-time person or two part-time people when it comes to ad revenue. Ad revenue is not that valuable for most content creators. And I'm in a high CPM niche most content creators that are full-time, I keep trying to tell you all this. Again, I'm going to expose the secret. 
If you talk to content creators and they actually broke down their income for most of them, 50% or more of their money that they live off of comes exclusively from sponsorships. That's why so many people focus on sponsorships. Sponsorships is what make people full time. Getting a $2,000 to $5,000 a month brand deal is where somebody quits their job or if they get two brand deals. And let's say they get two brand deals. They're $2,000 a month each. They're making $4,000 a month. That's a 12-month contract. That's about as much security and stability as a job offers nowadays is like, oh, Oh, six months, 12 months, they know that they're making four grand a month just from sponsors. And they know they're getting some ad revenue. They know they're getting some affiliate revenue. And they know they're selling some product, some merch or some course or something. That's how they quit their job because they have 12 months of security that a brand gave them for making a video a month or two videos a month or whatever for uh, two grand. And they got two contracts like that. So they use two contracts usually or three contracts from brands. They're recurring to get them to leave the full-time job and go full-time. That's why everyone tries to lock in brand deals is because it's about as much safety and security as they're going to get compared to a regular job. And then that's what they want. Now, my path was that I was already a full-time freelancer living hand to mouth. So I already was in this mode to where I wasn't relying on nine to five job anyway. So I kept building other revenue streams so that I could get rid of clients and fire all of my clients. And then with coaching, instead of having clients, I was able to have customers. And so then that became a different thing. And so for me, the recurring revenue models, I started with one-on-one -on -one and group coaching. And I did that so that I could go cash flow on one-on-one -on -one calls and re monthly recurring revenue on a monthly membership. And so that's what I used. Then I didn't build a course product. I built a $99 YouTube starter kit. Later, I built the brand deal starter kit. So then I had another cash flow product. And so by having those cash flow offers plus monthly recurring revenue, that's how I was able to get that to $100,000 a year after 2017. And that's why um, I've it's made me since 2017, after I got it off the ground, it's made me $100,000 a year. It didn't make me $100,000 a year the first 12 months. It was after getting it set up. And I used Kajabi to do that. And so then after that, what happened was I was able to make $100,000 a year roughly on average over that. So that means that after getting it off the ground for five years, I've made $500,000 from that. And that's because I don't sell courses. But now, because I've coached over 500 individual creators, I think, something like that, some weird number like that, because I've coached like over 500 individual creators, I'm like, okay, I probably now can come in and innovate and make courses for content creators, not necessarily just a YouTube growth course, but like I can make all these different specific courses for content creators because no one can argue with my experience and results, but I've actually taught so many people that I'm very confident about my ability to make something really higher quality than other people. And by the way, now the market, all the courses in the market are outdated now. Because YouTube's changed so dramatically that ever, even though just the last three years since the pandemic, that everything that everyone else made a course on for YouTube is now outdated a bit because YouTube Shorts is new. There's new features to YouTube Live. Memberships didn't exist yet. And a lot of the other features, backend and analytics, didn't exist. So now I would come in and I would innovate and have something new to talk about very easily. And it'll take a little longer for my stuff to get outdated. Plus, I have a strategy to make sure my stuff is never outdated. But that's an example of what I'm doing that like, if someone takes any niche and says, how do I make my stuff evergreen? How do I build three to four revenue models for my business? How do I build three to four real income streams that also themselves can expand and grow over time? And then how do I invest that back into my channel? How do I invest that back into the channel? Me? Hiring someone full-time on the YouTube side was not where I found the best return on investment and scale. So I hired help for my coaching business. Now, to some extent, it exists beyond a little bit of my coaching business into my general day-to-day -day because hiring my sister as a personal assistant, one of the best things I ever did in my life, and it helps me with everything. So um, there's that. Um, I already answered this question. I answered this question about roughly 30 minutes ago. Uh, Queen Cancer Tarot, thank you for the $10 super chat.
it's a hundred videos in that first year to get monetized with the goal of getting a hundred thousand views total and averaging three minutes of average view duration across the hundred thousand views. So that you have 300,000 minutes because then that's 5,000 hours of watch time roughly. And the requirement is 4,000 hours of public watch time, which gives you a threshold of safety to meet the monetization requirements for the YouTube partner program and start earning ad revenue. Architectural sh street metal with the $5 Canadian super chat. Do you think I could train people in a skilled trade virtually? How would you package and sell that? I think you can. And where I would probably start is I would look for a certification in your trade. My friend Pat Flynn did this in architecture with the, um, with the leads exam certification. So if you work in the trades, and I love people who work in the trades, we need more people who work in the trades, and we need more trades education. We need to bring back trade schools, make trade schools great again. Like we need trade schools, we need people in the trades, we need people in architecture, metallurgy, uh, mechanics, engineering, um, electrical work, plumbing, and also um, hydraulics, uh, metalworking. We need people like that, right? And if you're going to teach and monetize that, what I would tell you is this. Look at the certification programs and make study guides, paid study guides for the certification. And what you should do is you should take the certification test yourself like every year. And you should probably like even vlog yourself taking the certification every year. And if you could do that, then that's actually going to help the audience um, understand. It's going to be a great promo for what you're doing. I actually had a client. I had a coaching client, someone I taught. I had one of my coaching customers. Um does um, tutoring and did um, SAT prep and ACT prep and would show, you know, people like it would vlog, like, you know, taking that and scoring high and all the things and then would sell it. And there was other things. I think there was like uh, another one um, for doing some of the higher stuff like, um, you know, GRE and things like that. So course guides, like selling like certification and how to pass this exam study guides. And when I worked in the bookstore, when I was a kid, when I was a kid and I worked at Borders Bookstore, I worked at Borders Bookstore in the mall. Uh, it was Walden Books, but it's owned by Borders. So, and then they rebranded to Borders. So when I worked at Borders, one of the best things we ever sold was the, you know, test prep materials was our best selling item. Test prep material was our best selling item. So if you're going to be in the trades where I would start, is I would start with certifications that help people get a raise because people will invest in that. And then those certifications qualify them for a raise or a different position or a higher paying job. And then what I would do is I would use those certification test prep materials and I'd market around that. I would charge a healthy amount for that and people will pay for that and use your study guides and that will make you money. And you'll also get great testimonials out of that. And then what, what happens from there is possibly the ability to build a group program like you could make it a study group you could probably build a study group program and not just the test prep materials around passing the exam and you could basically do a boot camp you could do a virtual boot camp for your trades and so uh, i would look at that so i think that for trades people you could build a business model where you do certification um test preps and sell courses that help for exam preparation around your trades, right? And you could do that. You could make good money around that. And you could also offer a paid membership to a virtual study group that helps people as well. And that's something people will pay for because they're investing in their career development. Um, let's see. But you want me to review this YouTuber named R.C. Blakes. Um, let's see who this is. Promoting self-healing, self-actualization, 673,000 subscribers. Yeah, we could take a look at this. I got to already tell you why this person's successful. It's because um, there's a lot of people. Like one of the things, what the most important things to people are what? Health, money, relationships, and time. Universally. Universally, 
universally, I can tell you that basically channels that focus on um, health, relationships, money, and productivity, universally, those always work. If someone really just wanted to be successful, they could just focus on one of those verticals and be successful because there's a there's always going to be enough of a market for that. There's always enough market. There's always enough of a market for anything health related, anything relationship related, anything money related, and anything productivity related. There will always be a market for it. There's it's always easy. So there's a market. It's always easy to monetize. You don't have to be credentialed to do it. It's largely going to be predicated on uh, personality. And you can use common sense and you can use facts and common sense. And then it's just personality at that point. And it does, there's not really a technical level of quality that makes it a hard bear to entry. A uh, $500 YouTube camera, $200 to $300 microphone, decent lights, it's over. And you can make content daily and it would be fine. So uh, this person has um, almost 900 videos. And they had some videos that clearly went viral. So obviously that helped them. Clearly that helped them. Um, probably, I would say they probably have close to 40, 50 million views, if not more. What videos are they making? And I would say that the credential and social proof that helps them is clearly being a pastor. So there's a level of social proof there and there's appeal to authority and there's social proof. Very snazzy dresser. Um, looks like it's a husband and wife. Looks like they're married. So that adds some level of credibility. And they're focusing on, um, they're making a large quantity of content every month. And it seems to focus on the things that people care the most about, which is largely um, relationship. And it looks like there's a lot of focus here around women, which is probably the largest uh, consumer base. So I would say that since this has a clear target audience, this has a clear target audience, at least right now, it seems to like focus primarily on women. So it knows who it's talking to. It knows what message it's telling. It's speaking only to that audience. It looks like it's largely talking specifically to black women. So there's a Tyler Perry vibe there, if I was going to guess. The titles are very strong and the titles are most... Um, like emotionally driven. And so ultimately people click uh, titles that are much more emotionally compelling than they are logic based titles. So, and it's, so they have the quantity, they know the subject matter. They have a key target audience demographic that's largely consumers. They've been doing this for a very long time. They've made almost a thousand videos of inventory. So they've made a thousand videos that speak to the same audience. None of these are time sensitive. So all the content is evergreen. You could watch any of these videos, be promoted any of these videos in the algorithm at any given time, click on it. And then there's going to always be, no matter what part they're covering, it looks like there's nothing they talk about, that there's not 20 videos you could watch from. So then that means that they have a high probability of on a long enough timeline someone converting from a viewer to subscriber that exists within their target audience. So combining that with the fact that a couple of their videos clearly went viral with over a million views. Um, yeah. I'm not surprised that this channel is successful. Uh, what could this channel do better or differently? Probably would be the thumbnails. The thumbnails for this are most of the time. The thumbnails here are atrocious. The thumbnails are probably a two out of five, three out of five at best sometimes. Uh, this channel could be at a million subscribers if it didn't have crappy thumbnails, in my opinion, because uh, then whatever its click-through rate is, it could be higher. But the people are coming for the subject matter much more than the thumbnail. I would tell anyone that the topic and the timing matter a lot more than the thumbnail. The title is a reflection of the topic and the timing, so that's in the equation as well. That's the expression of that thing. Um, but I, I think that regardless of 
social proof or authority that if anyone made a thousand videos with um, the best titles out of this, that they'd be successful. <laughs> if someone literally just picked the 100 best performing titles for these videos and made better thumbnails and made the same titles, uh, especially in this day and age right now, um, it'd probably be a 100 K channel after 200 videos with the, with these titles or similar titles. If someone took the exact same thing, but reverse engineered the strategy to speak to men's issues, probably performs about the same, I would imagine, uh, because it's, it's just psychology and it's, um, group dynamics and, um, it's, it's very easy to see what, you know, what's happening with that. It's not necessarily anything very difficult to do. Uh, no disrespect or no, uh, discredit to them. It's just a matter of fact that that one's like, that one's like an easy one to figure out what's going on there. It's like, it doesn't require a depth of analysis to see, oh, I could see that. And that model has also been proven to work for like 40 years. Like, uh, that work, that model has worked in radio, television, and in ministry for like over 40 years now. And the message hasn't changed that much. So I would imagine that somebody with uh, better marketing, better branding, higher level of charisma, uh, better social proof could do the exact same thing. Or maybe with less. Or maybe with less. Um, Sun's Days, I would love for your suggestions for my channel. I'm a full-time content creator and want to grow. Um, so with this one, I wanted the twist of people asking for something other than their own channel, but I'll entertain it this one time, uh, cause I wanted people to, we're not doing a channel review stream as much. Um, but we can look at sudden days. Um, this one seems to be a pantry and prepping channel, uh, with 87,000 subscribers. So, um, trying to bring it up here on the screen. And again, I only wanted to analyze a few channels, not to do, because I don't really want to do channel reviews today. I want to do a channel review stream today. What I really want to do is just kind of to give you guys an understanding of how to reverse engineer what is successful and apply it to yourself. Because I think that's the hard thing to do is to see other people who are successful or even take advice from coaches. I think it's hard for some people, like coaching one-on-one -on -one works the best. Do you know why coaching one-on-one -on -one works the best and why I offer it? The reason that one-on-one -on -one coaching works the best and why I offer one-on-one -on -one coaching is actually pretty simple, is that the easiest thing in the world is just to be told what to do and then to actually do it from somebody who's actually done it and someone who understands what your situation and your specifics are and what your circumstances are and to tell you here's what to do in your circumstances with what you have, where you are, realistically, step by step. Here's what you should do. Here's your action plan. Here's the reality of your situation from a top-down view just for you and you alone and nobody else. Someone focused on your problems and nobody else and how to make the most of what you have going for you, what your blind spots are. That's the easiest thing to get help from um, if somebody were to tell you what to do. That is the, usually that is the best version of it. And the reason I bring them up and the reason I say that is because a lot of people are like, oh, YouTube advice doesn't work. It's like, because you have, like when YouTube advice doesn't work for somebody, they have a specific circumstance and they're using general advice. So they have a very specific thing that they need a prescription for, but they're taking a generic thing off the shelf that doesn't speak to that issue. And then they're surprised it doesn't work. That's where one-on-one -on -one coaching is more beneficial. Someone now, as for courses, I'll be real with y'all. To some degree, courses are for people who are already somewhat above average. Like courses are for people. I don't think courses serve people who are not already autodactic learners, meaning somebody that supplied the right information is capable of teaching themselves with no handholding and no additional help, but just needs um, information presented in the right order and in and, and complete information, complete information delivered to them and complete information that is delivered in the right order. And so I think that that matters quite a bit when it comes to, well, who should take a course? Uh, the person who should take a course is somebody whose only real need is they lack detailed information with no fluff in the right order with no distractions. 
And so that's why some people, some people can learn from just straight up YouTube because they don't need information that's as detailed, but they're already slightly above average. Someone a rank below them might benefit more from a course because they're, they're not just trying to fill in blanks. Like people who can learn from YouTube videos are trying to fill in blanks and gaps in knowledge that they already have because they're already slightly above average. They already have enough figured out and they're trying to solve a couple of solve for a few blind spots. They're trying to solve for a few blind spots or they're an absolute beginner trying to get a basic understanding of something to build off of. Right. So that is like who can learn from like free content. Free content is I need an introduction and basic understanding, or I need to fill in some blind spots. I only need to solve one or two problems here or there. And I think I got it on my own. And that still is for someone who to some degree can also be self-taught and might just need a little nudge in the right direction or need to know something they don't know, that sort of thing. A course serves the purpose. It can work for an absolute beginner if the biggest problem is I wouldn't know where to begin on my own. I wouldn't know what to ask. I don't know what I don't know, and I don't want to waste time. That's who a course at an absolute beginner level works for. A high beginner to low intermediate is good if it's I can teach myself this and I have no issues that are wildly specific that I, that I really need addressed. I can solve wildly specific issues on my own because I know myself and I know that part of me that is more niche or quirky or weird. I, I got that. I don't need someone to speak to that. I need best practices and I need a reference and I need to do things in the right order and I need systems and I need that. That's who that's for. The only benefit to advanced or high intermediates for courses is blind spots they weren't aware they even had or when they feel that their knowledge of something is incomplete and that they would like something that's a little more like I would say systematized or rigid instead of the loose thing that they built on their own or their loose understanding of it. They would rather have a more complete understanding of it because that is probably making them less consistent or confident about execution. So like that's my perception of it. And I have the same opinion, by the way, of traditional learning much in the same way is I think the best thing for the majority of people is handholding. I think the best thing for the majority of people is as close to in-person hands-on as you can get. And if you can't get in-person hands-on, then virtual is the answer to that, which is like either a workshop or an online uh, training or a one-on-one -on -one coaching session with somebody, whether it's me or somebody else. I think that's the way to learn it because I think for most people, they need to be shown and talked to and they need it directed at them and they need focused one-on-one -on -one attention. That's why private schools have smaller classrooms is extra one-on-one -on -one attention. So I, that's just how I think. That's how I think. But yeah, let's look at this channel. Let's look at this channel. So project pantry and pantry preparedness. So for one thing, I can say that these are, um, some of these thumbnails are more effective than others. I'd avoid repetitive thumbnails because if you see something, you can skip over. If, a, if thumbnails are too repetitive, you could uh, see something and then you could assume that you've already seen it before and then you may not click on it. Um, these thumbnails aren't the worst, but they're not great in several instances because one of the problems I have with these, even though they worked, they worked. One of the, um, and this might work and the audience for this might be slightly older. So the thumbnails don't have to be, wow. The thumbnails don't have to be, in order to work. The problem I have is if the audience is older, then they can't read this. Like I can't read this without my glasses, even with my glasses, it'd be very hard on a smartphone compared to other things. Uh, I would also focus more on photography than on words. And I would try to make the photography better. I would try to start to get to for any channel like this and for channels in general, for I, I'm, as you guys know, I'm a camera snob and I have a background in photography. Um, I'm actually a really good photographer, if I do say so myself. Uh, focus on photography that would make sense either as editorial photography in a magazine or would be the photography used in the advertisement for the company. And that will help you better with views. Um, 
Let's see. It doesn't feel like shorts are doing as much to grow the channel. So let's see what videos were popular because it's probably you've made a thousand videos. I would I would assume that if you made a thousand videos, it's probably the top 20 or 30 videos that really grew the channel. So there are probably a couple of videos that are big hits. It seems like the videos that did the best are much more focused on prepping. And it also looks like these videos were older and evergreen and had a lot of time to accumulate. So it looks like the majority of uh, content. And it makes sense that a lot of it looks like it grew during the pandemic. I would do more of the videos. So I would look at like, so, okay, so let's look at your best performing videos and let's figure out how to get more out of your best performing videos. We're going to ignore these two because they're from so long ago. This video on impending food shortages. Oh, great background on that. So really good. Focus more on prepping and focus more on things that are around prepping and prepping challenges. And a lot of videos, I would say, you need to make more videos on canning. I would make a video on canning two to three times a month for sure. Two to three times a month for sure, I would do a video on canning. And the thing is, I'd probably do a pantry tour every month or every quarter or every season. Actually, I have it. No, it's not every month. Do it. Do a spring pantry tour, a summer pantry tour, a fall pantry tour, and a winning, a winter, uh, sorry, winter pantry tour, a winter pantry tour. I would also make more food storage videos. Um, I'd make food storage videos for sure, once a month, at least, if not twice a month, I'd make them one to twice a month. I'd make videos about cheap food at least once a month. So I'd build out a strategy where my content buckets would be, I'd make videos about food storage. I'd make videos about canning. I'd make pantry tours. I would make food shortage videos. I would make prepping, um, I would make prepping uh, videos and I would be doing a lot of that and I'd be making, um, yeah. And so I would do that. I would do a lot of the, I would do a lot of that. And those would probably be my buckets. And I would get out a video one to two times a week, probably twice a week. I'd make a hundred videos a year. I'd make a hundred videos a year. I'd make a hundred videos a year. So I'd probably make 10 pantry videos. I'd make 10 to 20 pantry videos a year knowing that every season, one of them could be a pantry tour. So my content strategy for a channel like this is I'd probably make, I'd probably make 10 to 20 pantry videos a year. I would absolutely make 20 to 25 canning, canning videos a year. And I'd make 20 to 25 food storage videos uh, a year. And then once or twice a month, I would talk about prepping at about food shortages one to two times a month. And that would probably be how I'd make 100 videos a year, at least for the next year. That'd at least be my strategy for the rest of this year or going to next year and how I'd make 100 videos in a year. And that would probably, and again, I'm basing this off of what your audience has responded to the most. Your audience responds to canning videos. They respond to pantry videos. They respond to food storage videos. They respond to food shortages uh, videos. And they overall are clearly preppers. So if I know, okay, my audience is preppers and I can identify these things that preppers care about, that's how I would be making a 100 video strategy. And so I hope that sudden uh, days that, uh, that answers that for you. And I hope that for the rest of you, that that serves as a lesson. Because like, if you want to grow a successful YouTube channel, content strategy is one of the things you most of you need to solve for. That's why I built a playlist on my channel about content strategy. What are the problems you need to address in content strategy? In content strategy, you know how to need you know you need to learn how to niche down to an audience when it comes to content strategy. So you niche down to an audience. Next, you have to figure out what is the desire of that audience that I can fulfill. What is a need, a want, desire, fear, concern, whatever for that audience that I can fulfill? How do I empathize with the audience? How do I validate something with the audience? And then what do I offer them? 
So you understand how to how do I empathize to, to that audience? How do I relate to that audience? What do I have in common with those? All right, here's these people. How do I empathize? What do I have in common with them? What about my background? What about my story? What can I share? How can I present in a way that um, is relatable to them? So that's how I empathize with them. How can I relate to what they are dealing with and what their experiences are? Okay, great. How do I now validate um, that audience in terms of where they are and where they wish they were, where they would like to be, and how do I validate that? And then what do I have to offer to that audience and what's the unique thing that I offer to them? And then how do I make that unique enough that's fulfilling and validating the desire that they have, but is um, interesting and unique enough to and is to my own lived experience, abilities, expertise, whatever, story, whatever it is, that is then hard to duplicate and hard for me to be replaced. Okay, so if you reverse engineer that off of me, there's a lot that makes sense there. How do I empathize with the audience? I'm a solo content creator. I don't have a team. I don't have 50 people working for me like a Mr. Beast. I don't have three friends running around with cameras like Ryan Trahan. I am a solo content creator and I've been doing it for a very long time. So that's one level of relatability. I'm not a 20 something year old content creator. I am 38. Most of my audience is either coming into their 30s in their 30s already, heading into their 40s, in their 40s or, or older. So people can relate to the, okay, um, I'm, I'm not necessarily a young content creator. I have responsibilities, I have a life, I have bills, I have a mortgage. Okay, so that's a relatable factor. So I can empathize with that. I speak to content creators in that situation. I am not myself a working class content creator, but I relate to that because 10 years ago, I was a person who was making like $30,000, $35,000 a year. So I can understand and I've lived long enough and I'm an adult and it's fresh enough in my mind and it's enough of my lived experience and trauma to where I can understand working class issues. And so I can understand and I know exactly what it's like to make $30,000, $35,000 a year and then say, oh, I'm going to, I want to do something else. I want a different way to live. So I can understand that. So I can empathize that because it's in my own story, right? So that empathizes. So then when I communicate based on that empathy, it validates the people watching. It validates you when you're watching because you know I legitimately understand. And the best part is I've been on YouTube so long, you can kind of go back in time and see me go through these things and evolve to where I am now. So that's the other part of it that um, is easy to help validate with the audience and validate the experience, okay? So then it comes down to, when I say and I talk about these things, people understand that I can can relate to these experiences. And so that builds a level of credibility and trust in, because it's built on authenticity. So when we empathize with the audience, it has to be from an authentic place because that's what's going to validate what you say. And then in terms of what you offer that addresses that thing. Well, so what do I offer content creators? For one, I offer the truth in the form of I talk about the reality. I don't sell the dream. I talk about the harshness of it. I talk about the mental health struggle of it. I talk about realistic expectations and I talk about processes. And I admit that a lot of what I say is not about having fun and that my system is more about being ruthless and getting numbers and hitting goals and being strategic and treating it like career development that is suited to a hobbyist or someone who has fun. So when I say that people like the transparency of the fact that it's like, okay, he's not selling the dream. Um, he's, and then the fact that I show my own analytics also is authentic and that's harder to duplicate. And a lot of people won't do that. I show my real numbers. A lot of people don't do that. And I talk about processes in a realistic way and I showcase those, I framework those. And I also, um, run through different scenarios. I also have an understanding of a lot of different niches and I also have proof is in the pudding. I've worked with hundreds of creators and a lot of people can vouch for me and I've been doing it for a very long time. And so there are enough unique things that I can offer in terms of transparency, trust. There's enough talent that I can demonstrate on my own. The fact that I've made 1600 videos, these are a lot of unique aspects to me that are very difficult to duplicate. So that means what I offer is unique enough and I don't give the same advice as everyone else and I don't have the same experiences as everyone else. I also don't have the same formats as other people. So there's a lot of different things. You can build out what you offer and you can make that deep. If you really want to, you can go really deep with what you offer. You can go broad and deep 
there's a lot of ways to do it. Depends on how long of a career you have. But this is about strategic thinking. This is about strategic thinking. So what's my story is a really good foundation for how you relate to an audience and niching down to an audience is what's my story? Because maybe what I should niche down to is something to where when I talk, I can say it with confidence and also I can be believed. So the thing is you should build off authenticity. Niching down is ne like niche down to what is your most authentic and distilled version of yourself and who you can relate to. Think about it. So that makes the most sense, right? So niching down to a specific audience is niching down to people like you. Niching down to a specific audience is niching down to people like you because that's what's going to be most authentic. That's going to be most relatable. Niching down to what is a problem I have already solved with my ability and talent for a younger version of me? Or what is an experience that I can put myself and challenge myself with? If you're not an expert at anything, great. If you're not an expert at anything, great. What could a person like me take on as a challenge that would uplift and inspire other people like me or would make other people like me curious about doing that same thing and, and maybe having that experience or would be entertained by seeing me, someone like them, someone like them go through that or take that on. So you can think about it in that way. Um, Uncle Stu, Uncle Stu, the old man on the block. What would you say about the black man's channel? I'm trying to teach self-development. Um, I think you mean you're either trying to teach self-improvement or personal development or both. If you're trying to teach self-improvement and personal development, um, one, you have to already know how to list a bucket of problems that exist in terms of personal development. And I would pick a lane. I wouldn't get too broad. I would say, okay, what's one thing I could teach uh, black men to improve on that would dramatically have a, a recognizable and immediate outcome in their life? So if you wanted to do that, I would focus on a couple of things. And so maybe you could focus on, if you had a background that lets you do this, you could focus on image, for example. You could say, you could focus on image and how to present yourself and how to dress like a grown man and, you know, not look like a teenager, not look like a boy. You could focus on that. Like my friend Antonio for real men, real style teaches men how to dress. And you know that to a degree, the clothes make the man and it helps build confidence. It shows the world who you are. It puts your best foot forward. You do this in job interviews. You do this on dates. You do this for networking. You do this when you represent your faith and you walk into your church. You, you know, it's like, what you decide to wear says a lot about you to the world. You could focus on that. That'd be one, and you could focus on that area. And there's a lot of buckets to niche down if you went with that. That's just one idea. That's just one idea. There's another channel, Charisma on Command. You could focus on building charisma and confidence and how to communicate, how to articulate yourself, how to have conversations, how to develop in terms of being a better speaker. That, that's what Communicators on Command does. And that like, okay, quality of communications, quality of life. So we've already addressed potential areas of self-improvement. Now, self-improvement channel that wanted to be well-rounded could focus on a combination of, well, let's deal on how you speak and how you communicate to the world and also how you present and how you look to the world. And then after that, it could also um, focus on networking and relationships. And I think that'd be a good trio. That's a good trio. It's like, here's how you look, here's how you sound. And then here is who you put that in front of. That's a really good trio. That's a strategy. So again, I think it comes down to, you have to decide on how to serve people and how to figure out specific problems. That's called a content strategy. Again, one of the reasons people hire me is to get clarity on their content strategy. Cause it's very difficult sometimes to like figure out what the right combination of things to make is and also to get it narrowed up and focused. But again, a real great value proposition is like, hey, if any man wants to improve his life and he just focuses on these three things, how he looks and presents himself to the world and everything and dressing like a man of taste and confidence and dressing for his body type and understanding um, fit, fabric and function, that would be, okay, great, boom, easy value proposition. That's one bucket. Hey, speak to the world as a man of intelligence, speak with confidence, speak with authority, speak with clarity, say what you mean, be a man of your word. That's like, okay, communication is a really good bucket in addition to personal image, style, appearance, fashion, like image and communication. Those two things alone get you further in life. So if you wanted to help develop black men, you could do that. And then beyond that, you could either then focus on the component of the traits and values 
of um, men of distinction, men of status, men of confidence, or you could focus on networking and the fact that networking opens doors and that you can use that in every and every aspect of life. So you could do a content strategy that is predicated on this is a specific system to develop and to improve. And so I would focus on if you're going to make a channel like this, that's like, oh, I want to teach self-improvement. I want to teach personal development. That's generic and it's a dime a dozen. Build a system that produces results for people by focusing on three or four key areas of their life. Um, Robert Kiyosaki, what is he known for? Rich dad, poor dad. Why? Things like the cash flow quadrant. He's known for things like the cash flow quadrant. What is Roberto Blake known for? Roberto Blake's known for things like make 100 crappy YouTube videos. Boom. Like So you need something as maybe a system that becomes kind of the focal point of your brand and then the content is then derived in your content buckets of content strategy. If it's a self-improvement channel, it should be built on a self-improvement system. It should be built on a self-improvement system that says evolve as a person, as a human being in these three to four areas functional in your life and your life will improve and you will see results. And here's how and why. And then you distill from that. So that would be, that'd be my advice. Uh, fix it on the way. Thank you for the $5 Canadian. I appreciate you. Josh Friedman, really appreciate your streams, Roberto. Can you do a breakdown of we are change? We are change. I'll take a look. I have to vet these channels to make sure it's nothing out of pocket. Um, so I can look at we are change and I can see this heads up. I probably will avoid any channel that's political. To some degree. News is what somebody somewhere wants. 855K subscribers. Okay. Oh, they have a pretty good logo. They have a pretty good logo. Um, this looks like it. I'm waiting for YouTube to load this up. It's being slow. This could be politics. If I speak to it, I'll speak to it in a general way that will just focus on tactics rather than content. But um, in terms of what the channel does well, I'll basically evaluate its strategy rather than evaluate the content itself in any meaningful way. Uh, avoid politics, focus on money. <laughs> um, but yeah, all right. So it looks like this channel, is it videos or is it shorts? Uh, it looks like it defaulted to the YouTube shorts at the top, but it doesn't seem like the YouTube shorts are getting as much play. So I don't think shorts is making them successful. Ah, they're thumbnails. That's it. That's it. The thumbnails. They're posting daily content and the thumbnails are winning. Those are really good thumbnails. Um, and they post daily. So that's a big part of like the success here. Oh, 3000 videos. Yeah. 3000 videos, news topics, um, largely well-known public figures have been doing it for 10 years. Thumbnails have definitely improved. Hmm. Yep. I could see it. So if I was going to say, why is this channel successful or give you a breakdown of the success? What I would tell you is that what the channel does well is it's, um, doing a better job of headline writing than most news organization in terms of the headlines that's using in its video titles. Um, so, it's doing extremely provocative titles, very effective eye-catching thumbnails. The thumbnails are all visually interesting. They all inform you of what the video is in the thumbnail through storytelling. Um, all the thumbnails are bold and all of them are eye-catching. So they vibe perfectly. I have a framework for thumbnails that I call Vibe, this Vibe framework. And the Vibe framework is, um, I was going to tell you what the Vibe framework is. The Vibe framework is... It has to be visually interesting. It has to inform the viewer through storytelling in the thumbnail. It has to be bold in terms of its colors, contrast, and its depth. And it has to be eye-catching above all else. So um, the vibe framework for thumbnails, right? Um, at some point, I'll probably teach a Skillshare course on thumbnails uh, in some kind of partnership with them. Because uh, I've been talking with people about doing stuff with Skillshare. And if I do that, it's probably going to be a thumbnail masterclass. And I'll definitely teach the vibe framework and how to execute it. But uh, yes, it's it's the thumbnail strategy 
and it's largely their topics. And because they're doing daily content, they are winning on timing. Some of the content could also, in theory, be considered evergreen rather than just news. And it all compels curiosity. And it all uses known public figures in almost every single thumbnail. Uh, so it wins off of um, being able to be recognized. And so since they're doing daily and they've been doing it consistently, that's why they're almost a million subscribers. Um, if anybody does a thousand videos per se, and they did them effectively, because the thing is, it's not just about making a thousand videos. You'd have to make them effectively. If you make a thousand videos and every thumbnail passes the vibe check and has a four out of five or a five out of five, and if most of the videos, if 80% of the videos are evergreen, and 20% of the videos can capitalize on the timing and ride a trend or a news topic. That's a really effective topic, title, thumbnail, and timing framework. So to reiterate that, if the thumbnails pass the vibe check and the topic is still one topic, as in one, one thing that an audience cares about, it doesn't have to be news. So it consolidates the interest of an audience through the topic thesis. And then every title is written effectively as a headline that uh, that competes at the level of like a news organization type headline. So it's effective titles, the right topic audience. And then if 80% is evergreen and 20% is trending topics, um, and then the thumbnails pass the vibe check on top of that, you're going to get views. You're going to get views. You're going to like, and if you're doing that consistently for hundreds of videos, low than thousands of videos, it will succeed. It will succeed. You cannot make hundreds of videos with perfect thumbnails, strong, aggressive titles that have to, like, aggressive titles that trigger people, get them curious, get them angry, make them excited or uh, cause concern. Like emotional headline writing. Like, one of the things that in my video about chat GPT is I tell you about like using chat GPT to say, rewrite this title, but use persuasive speech or rewrite this title and have it um, trigger anxiety, rewrite this title and have it build up curiosity or suspense. There's like, that's how you tell it to rewrite and then tell it, make this something that is at a sixth grade reading level, make this something that is 50 words, uh, sorry, 50 characters. Like that would be an effective way to use chat GPT to rewrite titles. So if you can understand an audience, really understand an audience and understand who they are, then you can write effective headlines that speak to that audience and consolidate their feelings and that validate their feelings largely or challenge them. And then your thumbnails on top of that pass the vibe check. And then 80% of what you do is evergreen so it can keep getting you views, keep getting you subscribers, keep printing money because it's evergreen. It lasts year round or you can milk that video for two years, three years and still get views, subscribers and money from it. Print money, print subscribers, print money, print views because it's evergreen. And then 20% to stay relevant, you tap into what's current and what's hip and happening. That's an effective strategy. And when you do that for several hundred videos, your channel will inevitably be successful to some degree, to some degree. So, um, and this is what, if you look at any content creator that you see with like 500 to a million subscribers through the lens, for, through the lens I just mentioned, the thing that I just mentioned, go look at like your favorite content creator and then pass through the checklist I just gave you and you will see that all of your, this is exposing the secrets of full-time content creators. Like your favorite full-time content creators. Their titles are good and emotionally compelling and either trigger your emotions, challenge you, create curiosity, or induce fear or anxiety or hope. Okay, they do. They uh, Some emotion, some high-level emotion. Okay, their thumbnails pass the vibe check. They're visually interesting. They inform you of what's in the video through storytelling. They're bold and they're eye-catching. They pass the vibe check. And typically, you can say with certainty that the audience, you could describe who a viewer of that channel is fairly easily. The audience is not as diverse in terms of what they care about as most people would think. Like the audience is typically um, very much 
like the same tribe. The audiences are tribes. Niching down is about realizing audiences are tribes. Audiences are tribes, and tribes have their own culture, their own rituals, their own language, their own vernacular, and they have their own values and priorities. So when we niche down, we're niching down to a group of people that have very specific values, very specific priorities, very specific interests, very specific in their culture, very specific in the words and vernacular and words of power that matter to them, and very specific in their habits. Like that's that's who we're niching down to. And that's why we pick the topic that we pick or the topics that we pick is around that. Then we use the language of the tribe in writing our headlines. And we use the imagery that appeals to the tribe in the vibe check for making our thumbnails. It all makes sense now, right? And then after that, there's like making the actual content in terms of the research, the scripting, the production, the editing. There's things that we do that are go further that we can talk about that if you want. But yeah, so uh, th that's what I would say. So um, Buick Outdoors uh, says... Brand deals are the way to go. I've made around 50, 1600 from AdSense, but close to 7,000 from brand deals. Plus I've sent quite a few, been sent quite a few free products. Yeah. Brand deals are how most full-time content creators or aspiring to be full-time content creators make their real money. It's on the brand deals. It's on the brand deals. Um, Aside from brand deals, I would say a lot of it is then either affiliate marketing, which can be really good. A lot of you do not use Amazon's influencer program nearly enough. You could be making a couple hundred bucks with that. Um, and then selling your own products, depending on your niche. I know it's harder for entertainers. It's harder for gamers. If you're an entertainer or a gamer and you're like, oh, it's really hard for me. I can't make a digital product or whatever. Get really good at making print-on-demand products, but don't make it about you and your logo. That's what people get wrong in the entertainment niche. You need to make an actual like clothing line. Make your merch. You need to think about what's a clothing line look like and how do I make the dopest clothing line? Maybe I don't do it myself. Maybe I hire designers on Fiverr or something like that, and I build out a real good clothing line. I invest some money up front in this. And then what well, if I make it so cool that it's not just for my audience, but it's for anyone who is in my um, demographics, and then you build like a real e-commerce business about it and you you go that route, right? Like make like a real thing that people would really care about and be invested in. And then also a lot of you don't realize there's really good margin in making posters. There's really good margin in making posters compared to making t-shirts and hats and hoodies. It's really good margin on that. That was kid. Do you have a video on how to properly use TubeBuddy? I feel like I'm not using it properly and thus wasting my time and money with it. I actually have an entire live stream like this one on how to use TubeBuddy properly. Let's see. Thank you for the super sticker. Appreciate you. Andre the Dragon says, God bless you, man. You're awesome. Been following you for three years. Keep up the great work. Thank you, Andre. I appreciate you. Thank you for the super chat. Roberto, your live is so focused. No blah, blah, blah rant. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, I try. I really do try. Uh, her real review says, hey, Roberto, been struggling uh, with my channel. So I'm thinking about starting a faceless channel and seeing if it, I can start from scratch. If it works, I'll pivot on my channel. Yeah. Um, with faceless channels, the good news is like people, the good news about faceless channels, I'm making a video about this specifically, is why you should start a faceless YouTube channel is I think that with faceless channels, you can take more risk and you're worried less about being judged if it's a faceless channel. The anonymity, I think it gives you the ability to have more risk, um, take more chances. Also, I think 
that you can divorce yourself from the emotional part and being bored and say, I'm going to just do what works. I'm going to be ruthless. I'm going to do what works. I'm going to make this channel effective. I'm going to just do what works. I'm going to just double down. I'll make 20 of the same thing if I have to. I think it's easier to do that when you're a faceless YouTuber because I think that you can divorce yourself more emotionally from being invested in aspects of it that aren't working for you and say, I'm just going to do what works. Um, so I feel like that can be pow a powerful way to go. Yep. Sewing reports like I'm at hundred K and it's just me. I don't plan on bringing additional help anytime soon unless something drastically changes. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah, sewing report went um, full time with just like 8,000 subs, you know, and again, when you have like no kids, you can live in a place where expenses are low and you, you can do that sort of thing a little bit more easily. So just kind of keep that in mind. Yeah, and YouTube can effectively market um, a business. Um, Charlotte Ann Moore says, why do you still edit your own YouTube videos? I'd say this in all modesty. I'm, I'm going to say this in all modesty. I'm not saying this is purely um, a brag or a humble brag. I still edit my own videos because I'm one of the fastest video editors in the entire YouTube community. I am, and I'm not joking. I've met enough YouTubers. I've talked to enough YouTubers. I swear to you, I am one of the fastest editors in the entire YouTube community. And I'm one of the fastest editors in Premiere Pro in the entire YouTube community. And I actually know Premiere Pro. I am intermediate at After Effects. I'm effective at green screening. And because my files are so large, I shoot 10 bit 4222. I, I shoot 4222 10 bit. Um, so that means that when I shoot a video, the file for the video that I shot is always 20 gigs. It's always a 20 gigabyte file. And so when I'm using, cause I shoot it um, high bit rate as well. I shoot it um, high color depth, high bit rate and 4k. And I shoot uh, 4k 30 frames per second. So those files, the time it takes to transfer those files back and forth twice is too long to have not have been actually just editing the damn thing. So first of all, the files are too big to justify theoretical time savings just in transferring the files at that point because the, the time ate up in transferring files is already so long that you might as well start editing. So if I was going to have an editor, they would likely have to be an in-house editor. They'd have to be local and they just have to come and work on one of my other machines or workstations here, or they'd have to be coming in at the beginning of a week or whenever I call them locally, come in, pick up a hard drive, here are the files, here's a Samsung drive. So it's like, so what we do is uh, they'd have like one of these Samsung T7s that's like a terabyte. They'd have a, uh, they'd have a terabyte here of one of the Samsung T7s. They'd have to come in pick up five or eight videos that I filmed 20 gigs a piece. So about almost uh, 150, 200 gigs of files. They'd also have to already have all of the assets for the, for the presets, motion graphics, um, all the assets that we use, all of my custom animation graphics, um, all of the soundtracks, all of the stock footage, all that stuff. So they'd have to get one of these and they'd have to come and every week or every couple of days, they'd have to come in person, pick up about a quarter of a terabyte worth of footage, download all of that, and then get to work editing, send me low res revisions to look at for everything, save all the project files. Okay, we got it done. Then they have to come and they have to bring that back. And then we have to archive it over on the NAS. We have to archive it on the 64 terabyte NAS, which actually only has, I think like, uh, 48 terabytes because it's uh, RAID 6 architecture for redundancy. So two drives have to fail for the whole thing to fail. So we back it up there. And then we back up everything to uh, Dropbox after that. 
And so then we also archive everything in the final archives and the C drives. And so then it exists in three places. It exists in three places. It exists in portable format, cloud format, and in archival format on the NAS, on the network. So that's why someone has to either come in and edit here, or they have to come in, pick up a drive and edit at home, which means they have to be local to my area. So that's the only way to make it practical for me to have a video editor because the files are too big. The library of assets for the custom editing are custom self-made in-house things I made or even the things that use templates. I have to get them all those files and all the customization, and then we have to review it back and forth. So it literally would have to be an in-house job. And the reality is I don't mind hiring or training somebody for that job locally, but it doesn't work remotely. What would work remotely is my interviews. If I have someone do the multicam edits and edit my interviews and then edit clips of my interviews, we could do that. But for my actual videos, it's faster for me to do it because I have all the systems and I know everything. And I'm also one of the fastest editors in the community. So the, it's just, um, there's a level of complexity to what I do. It's subtle, but people don't see that. Cause like they just see my videos as talking head videos. They don't, if you look at the last video I uploaded, the complexity of that video is fairly robust. It's actually very highly edited. So people take that for granted. I also do all my thumbnail design too. And for doing that, I take photos that I use and poses that I made for that. In theory, someone maybe could do that, but most people are not going to be as good or fast with that as me. So I hope that answers that question. I'm going to contract to, um, I'm going into contract to produce a YouTube channel. What details should I have in mind? What should I offer? Um, T.Y. Bling Auntie from the TLA Mastermind. Okay, so Bling Auntie, I don't know a lot of the details or specifics, so I don't know what you should ask or have in mind or what you should offer if you're going into a contract to produce a channel because I, I would say what you should at least have is you should know the scope of work. You should know the complete scope of work, what they expect, what the deliverables are, and they should have kind of at least they should have the scope of work and they should have the key performance indicators and they should be able to make that clear to you. And then you'd have to build up everything from that. But you should at least have those details if they're trying to put together a contract. Now, without me knowing those details, I can't offer anything very meaningful. Um, can you do an entertainment personality type channel like unwind with tasha k or lovely t those are basically um celebrity gossip blogs there's not really anything to unpack there i'm not saying they don't have a strategy i'm saying the strategy is btmz the strategy to that is btmz there's not really anything that meaningful to unpack there um to be honest with you nothing that i haven't already said I would say that I'm not as concerned with the platform undergoing changes with the algorithm as much as I'm concerned with the platform undergoing changes with its existing systems and features and product features. That That's what I would say. What, what I think changes and what people don't understand is that what changes is people's interest over time for and the demand for certain things. I would say the demand for certain things and I would say culture, culture changes enough. And I would say that that's, um, that's a thing that is not measured as easily. Javon says, question, I've been considering doing film and TV show reviews and roadmap all the releases coming out for the next three months to make content on. How would you jumpstart your channel with this in mind? I would launch the channel with six or seven videos up front same day or same week, same day or same week, I would launch the channel with six or seven videos that people could binge watch that they don't have to watch in a particular order. So I wouldn't launch it with episode reviews. I would probably launch a channel with character analysis 
or the conspiracy theories around the TV show itself or something like that, or rumors, I would launch with probably seven of the most intriguing things I could think of if I'm going to do it around TV and television shoot releases. So I would probably either launch it around characters, characters, casting, or controversy. I'd probably characters, casting, or controversy and start with seven or eight videos plus a channel introduction video. And I would launch all of those either the same day or with zero subscribers. I launched from the same day or the same or in the first week and launch that way. And then I'd put out one or two videos a week and I would like focus on if I'm doing TV shows and character reviews. Um, sorry, TV shows and film stuff. I would focus always on uh, individual character analysis and then also character relationships or um, shipping. And I would do episode reviews. I would do entire chapter arc reviews or story arc reviews. I would do um, that sort of thing. And I would do kind of character comparisons or character verses or things of that nature. And I would also then cover news about the show, like if there's casting or someone gets fired or if there's a controversy with the show. And I would basically cover all the things that the fandom and the community cares about. I would go and find Reddit forums for that TV show or that franchise. And I would sit there in the Reddit forums and see what people are arguing about. And then I would literally make videos that people use in their arguments. And that's how I'd probably do it. Kenneth, Kenneth De Silva says, Roberto, I'm trying to transition niches. What is your advice on the best practices? I'm a 2K sub channel. New niche is not too far removed from the previous one. Um, then I would just do it, but I would just start going heavy on quantity of that thing. I would make the same amount of what your current niche is for now. And I would make double the amount of what the new niche is going to be. That way I'm not taking away from the previous audience for now. Then I would slowly start to ramp that down a little bit. And then I would normalize the new thing because you're small enough for it to not really impact you that much. So that would be my advice. That'd be my advice. That way you can still fill out enough inventory to justify moving on for that audience to still have been served enough. And if the niche is, if the niche is similar enough, by making double the amount of videos per week or per month versus the previous niche, it's introducing and onboarding enough of your audience onto this switch to be able to normalize it faster. Mike's Universe says, is it possible to be approached by a brand as a shorts creator? I recently reached monetization requirements. Thanks and advice for the advance you give. Um, you can, and a lot of R and a lot of um, shorts, reels, and TikTok creators are approached. Um, the biggest problem I see in the community is that actually a lot of shorts, reels, and TikTok creators don't disclose their brand deals and follow the FTC guidelines for brand deals and integrations. A lot of them are just like glossing over that. There are some brands that are actually even paying influencers and telling them not to disclose ads and everything, which is really messed up. And brands shouldn't be getting away with that. And creators shouldn't be doing that. But most creators in the shorts, reels, and TikToks don't know any of this and are not familiar with brand deals, not familiar with the etiquette, not require, not familiar with what they're legally obligated to do and to um, disclose. So a lot of it is naivete on their part. And then there's a lot of brands that are just doing really scummy practices with that. So what I would say is, yes, it is possible. And a lot of creators are approached as shorts content creators, reels content creators, TikTok content creators. But you have to also be careful because brands take advantage of smaller creators. Like brands take advantage of small YouTubers and small content creators. And they take advantage of new content creators who don't know any better and uh, that's one of the reasons I started going a lot more on brand deals content. That's why I did my brand deals workshop is there. You don't know what you don't know about these things and brands can get over on you. They can underprice you. They can lead you astray. They can scam your audience. Um, so like with smaller content creators, the lack of experience can hurt you sometimes. And sometimes it's better to delay working with brands until you feel confident about what you're going into and until you know you can read a contract or unless you have help with those contracts to read them and review them to make sure everything's on the up and up. You have to research the brands you work with. You have to do your due diligence. 
And that can be overwhelming when it's like, oh, I just want to make videos. It's so a lot of people just get into trouble because they can be naive about these things. They can be new, they're rookies and they're taken advantage of. And it's just not a great situation. So, so just be aware of that. But yeah, you could absolutely get brand deals as a shorts creator. It happens all the time. Just be careful. Um, Cleanser says, what digital service could you provide to people as a gaming channel? I do coaching now, but are there others? Um, it depends because there are sub niches of gaming. If you offer something to other game streamers, that would like you could offer graphics to other game streamers as a gaming channel. As a gaming channel, if it depends on the game, there are games that have digital goods that people would buy for buy. Um, so there's things like that. And there's print on demand products that gamers would buy if you came up with stickers that make sense or if you partnered with a company like D brand and you make some skins or if you find a way to build your own. Look, if I was a gaming YouTuber, all right, this is the guy, this is going to be, I need to clip this somewhere. I'm going to need to clip this somewhere. Here's my answer to a business model. Here's what Roberto would do if I was a gaming channel. If I was a video gaming channel, first of all, I would not be a damn let's play channel. I would like, I'd be like, no, I'm not going to be a let's play channel unless I was probably doing Minecraft, unless I was doing Minecraft or Roblox, or unless I was like the greatest FPS player in the world or the greatest speed runner in the world, I would not do let's play content. I would, cause it's every, every 15 year old, every 16 year old does it. And then it gets a bad rap. And it's like, and if you're not the best in the world, there's not really a point unless I'm also going to, unless I'm going to be a tutorial channel. Right. So I would not be a let's play channel. I can use and leverage let's play content without being a let's play channel. So I would be a channel that uses gameplay and mods and I would create interesting stories because I would mod games and then use them to build storytelling and build things that people would want to watch. So I'll give you an example. I would do Grand Theft Auto and I would use hella mods and I would... um be Rick Sanchez and get a voice modifier and I'd be Rick Sanchez running around in GTA and I would do a role play series and a comedy role play series where I'm Rick Sanchez in G but in real life in GTA five with a voice modifier in everything and everything. Or I'd be doing what these new people are doing where they're like taking like Barack Obama and Joe Biden and Donald Trump and having them like kind of play video games against each other using voice modifiers and deep fake voice. So I would use deep fake voice to make interesting stuff like that or something if I was going to do let's play footage to make my content because that's actually kind of innovative. And that's a new genre of making content using Let's Play stuff. See, the problem I have, I don't have any problem with gaming channels. What I have is a problem with how generic, how uncreative, and how there's a lack of innovation and how much that niche is saturated with low hanging fruit. That is what bothers me. I love gaming content creators that actually make innovative, creative, unique, and interesting content. I love people who do that. I was like, I was binge watching today, somebody who did um, Rick Sanchez playing, um, Yu-Gi-Oh against a bunch of different um, characters and internet personalities and everything. I love that. That was great. That was smart. It was clever. I like things like that. So gaming content can be done and it can be successful. The problem is the majority of the market, gaming is not just saturated. Gaming is saturated with low hanging fruit. So it's not a problem that's saturated because there's room to innovate. If everything, if, if, if it's saturated with mediocrity, the answer is high quality, innovative, unique enough content. So what I would do is I'd make content more interesting and unique by going, okay, I'm going to use mods, for example. So that's one thing I would do. Now, in terms of how I build a business, once I have all this traffic because I made this unique content, is I would build a gaming brand around culture, which means that I would build a clothing line that is more about gaming culture than not and not about trying to piggyback off of the existing IP of any game. I would not sit there and know that I can be copyright claimed, copyright striked, or take down or trademark sued by making t-shirts and hats using somebody else's characters. I would make I would make a clothing line that appeals aesthetically and culturally 
to gamers. And I would lean into meme culture. I would lean into meme culture, and I would do that. I would also make interesting, even if I have to do some extra work, if I was a fighting games channel, I would make um, like wraps and I would make uh, custom wraps and skins for the joysticks. Like you, when people have custom joysticks for themselves for fighting games, you bring your own sticks. I would have custom graphics and things for that that do not use anyone else's intellectual property but are still so well designed that people will want that. And people would do that. I would make a deal with a company that produces custom, um, you know, sticks and do some joint marketing venture with them and get a, a licensing deal and get a cut of all sales of these physical joysticks that they sell. I would find a third party controller company and I'd probably try to make a deal with a third party controller company, or I would get a brand deal with backbone. If I was a mobile game content creator, um, you know, for the where they make the controllers for your phone. Okay. So I would do that sort of thing. All right. So I would do sit there and I would figure out how to make a clothing line that gamers would care about. And I would make an accessory line for the products that they already have by making custom skins for the Xbox, PlayStation, and Nintendo, respectively. I would do my research to make sure that I'm properly licensed to do that. And I would make these custom skins and I would do them and I wouldn't necessarily have to use characters. I would use aesthetics. And so I would do that. So that's one thing I do. And those are physical products. And then on the digital product side, on the digital product side, if I wanted to do digital products, I would be in a game with a digital economy like Roblox or even Minecraft. I'd be in a game that Howray has a digital economy and I would be leveraging the digital economy of the game. And I would be doing that and using my brand and leveraging the digital economy of the game. The other thing I would be looking at doing If I was a gamer, I wouldn't be so ambitious as to build some crazy video game. But I would get with a company and a developer, and I'd build something like what Mr. Beast did with the finger on the uh, on the screen app. Like I would do something with keep the finger on the screen app. I would do something like that and build a simple app that my audience would still care about and leverage that as a gaming community. And again, Instead of building it completely myself from scratch, I would just use my brand leverage and approach somebody that has the business already and then do a joint partnership and get equity and get a percentage. And then just use my brand to become the face of that product under their company. And so I would do that. Business, I'd get long-term sponsorships. I obviously get a long-term sponsorship and go after something like G Fuel. And if G Fuel doesn't take me, I go to one of their competitors. So I go with a beverage company, I get a snack company. Maybe I try and get a brand deal with Logan Paul and KSA on Prime and say, hey, I know that you're marketing this towards sports, but what about the esports community? You have an energy drink version now. You have Prime Energy. Let me market that. Let me be the face of that for esports. Boom. Get that deal. Okay. Or if it's not that, again, a competitor. Go to a competitor. Get a snack brand. Maybe even say like hit up Feastables and try to do something with their next product because their next product won't be candy bars. It'll be something else. Maybe there's a snack brand actually feastables. I should probably just DM them and just say, Hey, you should really make a competitive product in gaming and esports as far as a snack or an energy snack or a trail mix of some kind feastables and compete in that market. Okay. But like, yeah, so no one go do that. Cause I'm going to do that. And so <laughs> you, you know, I could, I could, um, so I could, I could go that route and I would say, okay, here are different sponsors I could have. I pursue the sponsors. Maybe it's a gaming uh, beverage company. Maybe it's a trail mix or snack type company or something like that. Um, definitely maybe some kind of skins brand. Maybe it's D brand or one of their competitors. Maybe I make my own competitor to D brand, but it's cheaper or something like that. Pair with the accessories company, um, that type of thing. Okay. Like in terms of other things you could do, is I wouldn't say it's necessarily the whole digital products thing. Cause again, it doesn't lend itself nearly as well as like courses or anything like that. But what you could probably do is you could probably build some kind of membership community. And so then you have monthly recurring income around a membership community. Maybe it's a private paid discord discord pays now. And so you could leverage that. So you build a business model 
around physical products as a gamer. You build it around affiliate links. You use Amazon affiliate links. You do a strong affiliate strategy for Amazon, but also directly manufacturers for certain accessories and things like that to the consoles. Maybe D brand has an affiliate program. You do stuff like that. So, you, uh, so to do that though, you have to also build content that makes sense that sells that. So maybe your main channel is let's play and storytelling. But if you're a gamer and if you're able to go full time or get close to full time, or you have an abundance of time because you're young, maybe you build another channel that's more about you know building the man cave, building the gamer's paradise. And it's about covering hardware and accessory and builds and PC builds and console stuff and big screen TVs and sound bars and stuff like that and, and gaming chairs and those things. And then you're able to be uh, more sponsored, more um, affiliate commissions, that type of thing, sell more print on demand, more physical product stuff, maybe develop more physical products. It makes more sense to go that route. So the thing is, as a gamer, if I was a gamer and I was hard set on, oh, I love gaming. All I care about is gaming. Da, 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 gaming. I do a gaming channel and I do a gamers channel. I do a gaming channel and I do a gamers channel. I do a channel on gaming lifestyle and I do a channel that involves some form of let's play content so I can milk my own gameplay of some kind. And maybe that's the route that I would go if I was doing that. But that is the, because I'm also like, I don't love answering this question because again, gaming channels, I like them, but it's not that interesting to me because everybody wants to do one and very few people have the talent to do it in an effective way because they either don't have the creativity to make it not generic and then they don't have the business acumen to do it. So if I was going to, so again, this is kind of my last answer on this and, and, until I make a dedicated video that answers it once and for all. But the answer to monetizing effectively and building a full-time business if you want to be a gamer is to lean hard into brand deals and to have multiple brands maybe as many as five brands on rotation with monthly contracts go heavy on hardware affiliate marketing for the gamers lifestyle okay maybe even direct to manufacturer affiliate marketing and to build a physical product line of your own so you can control your own income and revenue, and probably to build a membership club for your community. Um, and so that would be the monetization around a gaming channel is effectively that. It's definitely going to be physical products, brand deals, affiliate, and membership on top of ad revenue. So I hope that answers that question more or less once and for all, like once and for all. I'm going to have to obviously make a video or clip this for the gamers out there. <clears throat> uh, v... VS tips and tricks. Uh, thank you for the super chat. Hi, Roberto. I'm a new plumbing and heating channel in Denmark. I look a lot to Roger Wakefield. Yeah, that's a good friend of mine. I'd love to hear your take on his channel. Uh, my friend Roger Wakefield started his channel as Roger the Expert Plumber, and he started teaching people how to get into the trades. Then he became very much an entertainer and became Roger Wakefield himself instead of just Roger the Expert Plumber. So um, my take on Roger's channel largely has to do with his evolution and his journey. So I'm bringing up his channel. Uh, Aaron, this thing's being slow. Um, I'm bringing up his channel. And like what I would say about Roger's channel. Uh, it's being slow. Is that Roger's channel has become a personal brand channel that started out as a very focused channel that helped people uh, with plumbing problems. It helped build and market his local business, which I believe was in Texas. Um, and then he was able to become a personality. So Roger has made a thousand videos. So that's like, you know, like, there you go. So Roger made a thousand videos. Um, and his most popular videos have gone viral largely um, off of entertainment rather than purely education because he was able to leverage the social proof of, hey, I am 
Roger, the expert plumber. I am a plumber and I've been doing this for years. But then like during the pandemic, he was able to become an entertainment channel because he was able to react to things and it was entertaining and it was interesting. And so he had a lot of viral videos because of that. But here, look at these videos, great thumbnails. And these are about how to become a plumber. They don't get as many views. Roger can get millions of views if he entertains you. But for the education side, that speaks to a smaller amount of people. But it's still important to him. And it's also important for a larger mission of the trades. And so he does this. Here are the basics of plumbing. And you can see that these don't get as many views. Um, but there are interesting things where I make a lead and oakum joint. That is something that is very applicable. And same thing with the soldering thing. So like instead of how to or career, those things solve wide sweeping problems that are usually big. And same thing for these DIY plumbing tricks and tips. So again, you can see that the tips and tricks videos solve instant immediate problems that are happening like every day. So they get like, obviously they get more views because it's an everyday problem. So that's why the DIY stuff works and it's highly uh, utility. Um, Long-term, everything you need to know about water heaters. Water heaters are a big problem for a lot of people. They're also an expensive problem and there's very few videos that are produced around them in high quality. So that's where Roger has won is he makes high quality, very highly edited videos around these problems that are um, very expensive and intensive to deal with. And so that's where these get high views. But some of the videos he's doing now, they might do better in the future. They might be do, they may never do way better in the future because some of the videos he's making right now are not the videos that you get big views off of and you can see it here. And a lot of people would think, oh, God, this is so bad and the views are so bad. No, it's like it'll be fine because, again, two weeks ago, he made a video that got 100,000 views. Um, the, this Fabuloso video might do better later because there's a trend right now because there's a Fabuloso recall. So first day on the job, here's what to expect. This is a really high quality video that is about the trades in the career. So, again, Roger will make videos that are largely about his mission of helping people get into the trades. And those might underperform, but they're something he is not only very passionate about, but that matter uh, for society. I would say that there might be more effective titles for the videos that serve as mission, but they will reach more people, but they're not the people that they're meant to help. So that is the trade-off with what if I wanted to have the biggest YouTube, because there's a difference between the strategy that gives you the biggest YouTube channel and the strategy that helps the most people. There's a difference between the strategy that grows your YouTube channel the biggest, makes you the most money, and the difference between that and, well, what helps people the most. Um, and so for a channel like Roger, you can see that every month there is a banger video, but there's a lot of videos that are either slow burners or not going to get views in between, but they are massively helpful for the people who have that problem. So... Um, there's nothing wrong with the way Roger's doing his YouTube channel. It's just the nature of making a choice because even early on his channel was largely helping a lot of people, uh, do really well with, uh, certain problems in plumbing, do it yourself or getting into the trades. However, his channel blew up and got big because of some of the entertainment value and what Roger brings as a personality. Roger would be at a million to two million subscribers if he became purely a personality, but he has a bigger heart and a bigger mission than that. And I think that um, the videos that underperform are kind of a labor of love and they're him being charitable because he could really just do what works the best. He knows how to do that. He could just do what gets him the most views. And, and again, I think people would still love him if all he made was viral videos. But I just don't think that uh, his heart would be in that. Knowing him as a person, I just don't feel that way. So I could always call and ask him. <laughs> but yeah, that's my thoughts on Roger Wakefield. That was a like really good suggestion. Uh, Roger's a really good guy. 
And again, even my channel, like even with my channel, there's videos that, well, yeah, it's like, oh, they'll get more views. But, um, but like, I don't always think that just because something gets more views doesn't inherently mean that it's a better video. It just means more people are interested. Yes, please. Let's get these likes up. Appreciate y'all. World According to Briggs. Thank you for the $20 super chat. I learned everything about YouTube from YouTube. I'm still learning six years later. Yep, facts. Home Rapid Repair. Roberto, I'm 23 years old. Uh, 23 years. 23 years licensed as a builder. Okay, great. So you're not 23 years old. You're 23 years licensed as a builder. You're now working on a new channel for four months. Your opinion on paying AdWords for a little extra attention and growth. Um, I do not believe in using uh, AdWords or paying ad views to grow a YouTube channel. I do not believe in using that. I only believe in using AdWords for video to grow a business, grow an email list, or directly sell a product or service. Um. I do not believe in using paid ads on YouTube or otherwise to grow a YouTube channel, even though sometimes YouTube will recommend this, but again, they have to, because it makes them and Google money to recommend that strategy. But, um, and I'll, I'll give you a real easy, I'll give you an easy way to rationalize this on why you should not use paid ads to try to grow your YouTube channel. Has anybody here subscribed to a channel off of a paid ad that that channel ran? Has anybody here subscribed to a channel because of a paid YouTube ad for that channel? Honestly? And you're going to see there's not going to be a lot of people who will say yes. So, largely, you will not get the audience that you actually want by doing that for the extra attention and growth. You will not do that. If you want extra attention and growth... You know, it costs you zero money, but will get you a better audience from that. Go on a few podcasts in your niche. Go on to a few podcasts in your niche. Be a guest, even if they're smaller podcast. Go on to a bunch of podcasts for zero dollars, and you'll get more out of that than buying ads for your channel. You will get more out of just going on other people's podcast than buying ads for your channel. If you want a little bit of extra attention, again, like the ads, it's not going to work. People do not um, care. Like when it comes to ads, it's hard enough to convert customers off of ads. You're not going to get people to commit to YouTube channels off of them. So that would be, it may not be um, what people want to hear, but it's also the more straightforward thing. Um, what would be in my best interest would be to tell people that that works and then to hire me as an ad manager. But um, I'm, I, I'm strongly against that. GMAC TV. Um, I already told you all I don't want to do. I don't want to do channel reviews for people paying for a channel review of their channel versus a breakdown on somebody else's channel. And I'm only going to do this one for G GMAC TV, but I'm also going to tell you viral, you, you know, like you're probably young. That's probably why we think you want or need a viral video. I hate viral videos. I'm going to be honest with y'all. I hate viral videos. Viral videos are the most trash strategy in YouTube. I hate viral videos. Do you know why I hate viral videos? They are unduplicatable. They're unrepeatable and they favor the rich getting richer in the sense that it's like, if you want a viral video, you could spend a lot of money and you can make a viral video. Almost nobody makes viral videos that don't cost money anymore. And it annoys me because it just means that the strategy in YouTube becomes a like, okay, have a lot of money versus, and that's why no one believes in grinding and working hard because all they see is people throw money at their YouTube channel and then blow up and get viral videos and grow. And I hate it. I hate viral videos. I despise effing viral videos because all viral videos now are is find thousands of dollars to throw at a YouTube video idea. And there's a lot of people that are going into debt 
And I hear horror stories all the time of people who go into debt because they're trying to make a viral video and they spend money they don't have and they go thousands and thousands of dollars into debt praying that, oh, well, if I make a viral video, it'll make enough in AdSense and then I'll justify the video and everything like that. It's like, that is a one in a million unicorn strategy that most of you have no business doing because most of you are working class content creators and shouldn't be doing that. And so because of that, I now hate viral videos. I hate viral videos. I'm, I'm just being dead serious. I hate viral videos. I hate viral videos because it makes the YouTube community all think that they can just buy their way to a bigger channel. And um, the reality is that from, from the standpoint that I have, like if you're taking this seriously as a career and you aren't from a background where you have money like that, you shouldn't be doing that. But the thing is people aren't convinced that they can grow without a viral video. I have never, now again, People would say, well, Roberto, you don't get that many views. You don't get this. You don't get that. But I've never had a viral video. I've never had a viral video. And um, I just grind. I just grind. And I just do the work. And I just made hundreds of videos. And I think that that's the, the answer for a working class content creator because like, it's very hard. It's not impossible, but it's extraordinarily hard for a working class content creator to make a viral video. Because today, what goes viral is not what went viral 10 years ago, what went viral five years ago, or even what went viral during the pandemic. It's extremely hard to do now to go viral without spending money. Um, and it didn't used to be that way, but that's how it is now. And that's what people are accustomed to now. So, um, GMAC, you don't have too many videos on your channel. And... It's too all over the place because it's NBA 2K23, it's Madden 23, and it's Warzone 2. It's all over the place. There's not a consistent theme to it. The thumbnails are pretty good, but um, I think the reason that you're struggling, you're not doing that bad. You're at 81 videos and you're at um, 1,000 subscribers. I mean, that's better than what Mr. Beast managed to do, um, I think. I think Mr. Beast had only, he did 100 videos and he had like, 780 subscribers. Uh, PewDiePie did 100 videos and only had 2,500 subscribers. So at 81 videos and you're at a, um, 1,200 subscribers, you're not doing bad. Um, but your videos are too all over the place. You need to pick something. And it looks like you're young. It looks like you're a kid. It's like, you should probably just do this for fun. If you're serious, pick something. Like Just like a major in college, if you're serious, pick something. And... Um, if you want to be competitive, you just have to make a higher caliber of content if you want to be competitive, but that can be very hard to do because now like you're in a, you're in a niche to where, um, it's skill time and money dependent. You're in a niche where it's skill time and money dependent to be competitive. Um, I think out of everything, your shorts are probably doing the best for you. Um, if you were going to not want to niche down to just one thing, what I would do is I would take Warzone out and I would um, niche down to sports. I would niche down to sports YouTube. I would niche down to sports YouTube. And if you're going to niche down to sports YouTube as far as sports video games, you go NBA, Madden, and maybe MLB or FIFA. Actually, forget NL MLB, go FIFA. So if I was gonna be, if I was gonna, if I was you, I would be like, okay, cool. If I'm gonna be all over the place, I'm gonna be all over the place in a way that actually is meaningful. And I'm gonna go FIFA, Madden, NBA 2K. And then out of that, I probably am going to have some evergreen content that helps people get into the game. Then I probably do a bunch of the glitches, hacks, and things for the game. And also um, you could do the interesting facts thing for shorts, but on regular videos, video, vi regular videos, I would start listing secrets, tips, tricks, hacks, also beginner stuff, mods, um, things that are super hyper interesting. And the largest group of people are people who just bought the game or just got into the niche or just got into playing the game. And I would be focused entirely around them. And I think that that is a reasonable path to a 100K channel is 
if you're going to do that. And then like, again, I would try to make sure people understand my channel. And the way to understand it is I don't think people can understand like, why are you doing 2K, Madden and Warzone? 2K, Madden and FIFA actually at least means you're doing all the main sports. And that makes sense because gamers can be like, you know, into multiple of those sports at the same time. So that's why I would say. Yeah, just an FYI for people, if you, anybody else submits a super chat to review their own channel, I'm not reviewing your own channel. You have to ask me to break down someone else's channel. So I'm not doing it again after this. <clears throat> Roberto's correct. Just making content isn't a guarantee of success. Nail it down to what you solve and Say it in a million different ways. Yep. Roberto is breaking it down. I try. Hey, Andrew Can. What's up? Yep, he got it narrowed down to the simplest points. Good stuff, Roberto. Thank you. Nard Villian. Hey, what's up, Roberto? I seriously appreciate you. I must admit your journey of being a content creator is exciting, but it's not easy and can be damaging mentally if you let it be. Yep, absolutely. It absolutely can. Switch Corner says, I up I change thumbnails ever so often. Should I go back and update all previous ones? For evergreen videos, they're still getting views. If you think you can make a better thumbnail and they're still getting views and you think, oh, I can squeeze more views out of it, then yes. But generally speaking, uh, there's not a there's not a need to. NFT Frog says, I've made over 600 videos on an NFT project, but I'm stuck at 600 subs. Should I add more NFT project to get more subs or make more evergreen content maybe? Um, you're not making what people want to watch if you're stuck at that number of subs. And it's also not building out a community. It sounds like you're making like stuff about like the NFT space that you're interested in versus not analyzing what most people in that space are interested in. So I would, I would pivot. Can you talk about shadow ban channels using TTS? Um, I'm not that knowledgeable on it. Um, text to speech is still largely a gray area on YouTube. Shadow banning is still a gray area. Like nobody has a lot of details on that. So I don't want to speak on that because I'm not educated enough to give you an answer you'd be looking for. Her real review asked, Roberto, is it okay to have a mix of current topics and evergreen topics as long as you have both? My answer to this is that my belief is that you should either 50 50 it or 80 20 it. So it should either be half and half or it should be 80 ever 80% 80 evergreen and 20% current topics, which means 80% is year round. I can milk these videos for views year round, no matter when people watch it. And then 20 uh, the hundred videos is trending topics. So that means you can probably actually capitalize on breaking trending news. Most people can only do that twice a month. They'll miss the trend most of the time week to week, but twice out of the month, they could get it same day within hours of breaking news or whatever they can. Most people can only handle doing that twice in a month successfully. So that's about what I would narrow it down to. But then the rest of the time, you should just be evergreen, in my opinion. Now, if you are a full-time content creator and you're like Star Wars Theory, you might be able to get away with uh, being able to hop on news 
just like that. So, and do it multiple times in a week even. But I would argue that even with Star Wars Theory, if he does two news topics in a week, the rest of it's evergreen content. But he's daily, so it makes sense. Andrew Paulo, big thank you, Roberto. Your tips got me to 100K subs and over 400,000 in two years. Similar topic to Steve Ram, another student of mine who's crushing it. Thanks for all you do, man. Much love. Thank you, Andrew. I appreciate you. Andrew Paulo, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, no, I love success stories like that. I need to make a actual like log of like everyone that I've helped grow to either a hundred thousand subscribers or six figures because I think it's like I think that I don't have the actual number in front of me, but I know that there are well over a hundred plus a hundred plus channels that I know that I've helped get to a silver play button. And I know there are over 20 plus channels that I know I helped get to a gold play button. Um, it's probably closer to hundreds on the silver side, less than a hundred on the gold side, but I know it's at least 20. I'd have to think of them by name, but I know it's at least 20. And it's probably closer to 200 plus channels that I know I've helped get a silver play button. I have to actually follow up with people follow up with some success stories, make a spreadsheet because um, I should probably interview all of them. I should probably interview all of them. Hello, any advice on reaching your target audience? I create plus size fashion and beauty content, but only men end up following and interacting with my videos. I want to build a community. Find 10 women that you can study that you know have female audiences. Okay, find find the women that you know have female audiences and study them. Reach out to some of them, talk to them and ask them about how they built their channel but also study their strategies and start making more of the content that they're making and that will probably help you. Tim Simpson, thank you for the super chat. A lot of big creators like Jimmy seem to be making fewer but bigger videos. Would you have people create less but bigger videos or scale back to publishing more frequently? By the way, um, you demand as always. So Tim Simpson, this actually goes back to something I was saying earlier. If you're rich, make more videos. I'm sorry, if you're rich, you can make fewer but big videos. What, all right, so let me let you in on a secret. People that are like over 10 million subscribers on YouTube that make less videos have a team to such a degree to where one video from these people has over 1,000 hours of work behind it. Mr. Beast in an interview, his videos have 2,000 hours of editing and production behind them when you add up the hours of all of his staff, right? When you take the entire staff behind a Mr. Beast video, a Mr. Beast video has 1,000 to 2,000 hours of production behind it, which is TV grade hours of production, okay, for one video. Nobody watching this stream should entertain doing quality content like that because none of you have the manpower, the time, the investment capital, the efficiency, the resources. It, it makes no sense. None of you can do that, even if you wanted to. And it wouldn't make any sense. Now, people that are less than like 10 million, they're like 1 million plus that make like videos twice a month or they make less videos and stuff like that. The million plus subscribed channels that upload every other week or so. Those people, they still have more resources than you and they're full-time content creators and they still have a team and you don't. And they're still putting 100 to 200 hours into every video even some of the people who make weekly videos, even some of the people who make 100 videos a year. Like, okay, Marquez Brownlee and his team, they make 100 videos a year and they make the best videos in tech. He's at 15 million subscribers. He has eight people on his team. He has eight people on his team. And they make uh, two videos um, a, a week roughly because they make 100 videos in a year roughly, right? So they make two videos a week. But, but he has eight people on his team. Okay, 
So you have eight, and they're all full time. They're all full time. So that means that with eight people and 40 hours a week, and I'm assuming a 40 hour week is a minimum for them, and because uh, they could be working longer than that. Okay. So they put um, 1,200 hours, over 1,000 hours a week into the YouTube content that they make um, to make these two videos a week. So they're putting at least 500, 600 plus hours into an individual video. And that's quality content. Okay. James Johnny, whenever he edits a video and he makes his big videos, it's 200 hours into every video project that James Johnny does. It's 200 hours minimum into every project that James Johnny does. It's 200 hours minimum. None of y'all should be making quality over quantity. You, you can't do it. Who the hell has 200 hours to put into one video that is a working class content creator? A working class content creator cannot do that. You'd be making like five videos a year with no guarantee of how they turn out. And the thing, the difference also is that these people's 1,000 hours would take y'all 4,000 hours because of the difference in talent, the difference in talent, but also the difference in all their resources. They have the fastest editing computers so they can work more efficiently than you. So they have more efficiency than you. They have more experience than you. They have refined processes. They've had training and they've had training. They've got better training, better tech, more time, a longer amount of time invested in experience, and generally speaking, a lot of times more talent. It's not an even playing field. And I'm one of the only people I think that says that out loud. I say the quiet part out loud. It's not an even playing field. So when it's like bigger creators do this, they already are full time. So it doesn't matter. They're a full time. And whatever their imagination comes up with, they can afford to execute on. And they also have years of experience before that. They all have five and 10 years and three years and four years experience, like of uh, experience of being successful, mind you, and, ex and experience of doing it at a higher level. And they all have help and they all have help and they've all had help for a very long time, for a very long time. Most of you just cannot do a higher level of quality to that degree that would be competitive and trying to wouldn't be an efficient or an effective use of your time or ability in terms of competing at that level. And that's not, so you can't compete at that level and win. You can't, you can't play that game and win. That'd be like being a weekend, like amateur athlete going up against an Olympic athlete. It makes no sense. So I, I don't believe in that. I don't believe, oh, make bigger videos and publish less frequently unless you can literally do it for $0. And if somehow, some way, you could make it right size in your life while you have a full-time job. I, I don't think that's, and you, you might as well, you, I hope you might not have kids or, um, or a relationship. I, I, I would, or if you do, you won't for very long. <laughs> like, I don't think it's a reasonable thing. Like at all. I don't think it's a reasonable thing at all. Not for a working class content creator. If you transition to being a full-time content creator, you can start to begin to think about higher quality videos and making less, but doing higher quality. When you transition to being full-time, maybe after you've been full-time for at least a year and you know what it's like and you're used to it or you, and you've gotten stable, you have a little bit of money saved up. But if you just went full-time, how are you going to explain going high risk, high reward, and then not being able to pay rent because it doesn't work out? You see what I'm saying? People who do that are doing it from a very specific position. So like people, people doing that are doing it from a position that's radically different than the people watching this live stream right now. People doing that are from such a completely different world than the people watching this live stream right now, which is why I don't think that that's like, I don't think that that makes sense to do. I think you can do that though. If you literally are a kid who doesn't pay rent, lives at home, and you got nothing else, or if you're in college and you're on scholarship and you eat ramen, maybe you can do that. Maybe you can go big or go home. I think in theory, if your videos cost nothing because you do gaming, 
You could maybe just put more hours into the edits and call it a day. Maybe if you have enough evergreen videos that make you enough money to where if you didn't upload for a month, you'd still be okay. So maybe you could put a month into just making one big video to see what happens. And then you could try that. And every other month you could go, okay, quantity, one month, quality, one month, quality, quantity, one month, quality, one month. You could like trade off if a month isn't going to hurt you. If that's a big if though, that's a big if, but like, cause again, you have to remember when Mr. Beast was a working class content creator, he didn't do that. Like he didn't do this advice when he was a working class content creator. He used to live off like a dollar a day. He was a kid. He was living at home though. And he put all his money back into his YouTube channel. Same thing he does now, but he didn't have to pay rent. So that like, that makes a difference when you don't have to pay rent. You can take a lot of risk. The other thing is he was, he was doing qu quantity because he was trying to figure out what would work. And he did a bunch of that, figured out what would work. He was making money every month off of some of his viral videos they made for cheap. Uh, and I wouldn't say those were necessarily bigger videos. They were just riskier videos, but they cost him $0 and he was still making quantity at the time, not quality over quantity. He was figuring it out. So even that advice wouldn't have worked for Jimmy when he started and it didn't work for Jimmy when he started, when he started, he had to be quantity and he had to figure out something sustainable and he had to somewhat to some degree stumble into what could work in a reasonable way to justify what he was doing. But also, again, the worst case scenario for him is if it didn't work out, you're just going to go to community college and get a job and could keep trying to make videos, you know, if it doesn't work out, you know, move back in ho at home. It's like that's a, like that's a very different reality than most of the people watching this like channel right now is if, if you guys do something that doesn't work out, it's not that you're 20 and you're going back home and eating ramen. It's it's going to be very bad. So I don't. So realistically, like, but I also don't think that Mr. Beast and I speak to the same audience. So I think that someone who's 17 years old watching this content, it makes some level of sense because even if they're not rich to be able to throw money at it, they can throw a disproportionate amount of time at it because all they have to do is give up all their hobbies. Like if I'm 17, I could give up all my hobbies and I could make a big YouTube video and I could try to go viral and then I could throw all of my money into YouTube because I would have to pay rent. I, you can live at home if you're 17 and you can do that. You know what I'm saying? So, of course, if you're 20, you could move in with a bunch of your friends. You can work a BS part-time job or you can make money on Fiverr and you could make money on Uber. And then you could throw all of your money after you pay your portion of the rent and you eat your ramen and to try to make the biggest YouTube video and go viral and do that every time and go quality over quantity. You can do that if you're 20. You get what I'm saying? Like, so that's, that's my thought on that. And it's not that I'm trying to contradict like Mr. Beast advice, I'm positioning it as there is a lifestyle for which that is applicable. And there are several lifestyles for which it is not applicable to, to, to do that. So when I think of the lifestyle, which is not applicable to do that, it's largely, I do not think that lifestyle choice is applicable to people over 30, which is the majority of viewers of this channel. I do not think that um, lifestyle choice is applicable to anyone who has kids or a relationship, um, unless you're in a relationship with another content creator. I don't think that that's applicable to anybody who has to work a full-time job. Javon, thank you for the super chat. Looking to do film TV issue roadmap. Oh, I actually gave you, I think I gave you the advice on that already, actually. I need to start winding this down. Eyes are getting dry. Chloe says, I use Loom and Descript to edit because I'm not very skilled. It doesn't take up that much storage and it's super quick. Do you think that this can that this can work or does quality have a big impact on performance? Um, I like to personally just have high visual quality because I can notice it. Now, a lot of people, they watch on their phone. They don't notice it. I notice um, like pixel binning and things like that. Um, so I like high bit rate stuff. Um, but I think for most of you, you don't have to make things as um, high of a bit rate quality 
and an encoding quality as I do for YouTube. And as a, but I, cause my standards come from tech YouTube and from why I did a lot of tech content and from my background in photography and design. So I care a lot about lighting. Um, I care a lot about lighting. I care a lot about high bit rate. I care a lot about frame rates. I care a lot about that stuff. I care a lot about the technical aspects of it and future proofing. And that's also why I like doing 4K, uh, but none of you need to really worry about that. Most of you, your views are going to come from your phone and no one's going to care. Um, I'm just a snob. Uh, what made you choose Premiere or Final Cut Pro? Uh, I've been an Adobe person for like 25 years. 25 years I've been an Adobe person. I've been an Adobe person since I was a teenager. So um, it's that I, I'm not only um, brand loyalist in terms of Adobe in that way, and the fact that I largely owe a lot of my career to learning Adobe software, and then they've done work with me in the past. They've taken me to events. Um, they've let me go to meetings to improve the product. Um, I love that they listen. But I, my bias is that I know it inside out. My bias is I know it inside out. My bias is that it works on Windows and Mac, which means I can use it on any system and any PC and any system because I know Mac and Windows. I know Mac and Windows. I know all the shortcuts for both. I know... Uh, the workflow for both. So it means it's uh, platform agnostic. And so I prefer it because I can use it on any system and I can use it anywhere and it's cloud-based and I know it inside and out. Um... Until YouTube rolls out for everybody, and we'll see if they do roll this out for everybody, they're rolling out the ability to have multiple language tracks similar to closed captions. Until they do that, the best option is to make two separate language channels instead of having both English and Dutch on the same channel. However, however, by next year, I think all channels, at least all channels, they're monetized. Maybe it'll be all channels, period. We'll have the audio tracks for multi-language. Bigger channels already have it. It's in beta, I believe. I think eventually, maybe all monetized channels by next year will have that. I think that it's going to make it very hard for other platforms to compete with YouTube without having that in the future. Therefore... My answer would be that in the short term, different channels. In the long term, if that feature becomes available to everybody, then multiple channels will be redundant. But until you get that feature, you're hurting your channel. Right, Conscience says, um, with the infinite subscriber system, should I build uh, 50 videos on one topic at a time or 50 videos each on the three to five topics at a time? I'm focusing on authors. If all of the topics focus on authors, um, I think you could do two to three, two to three topics at a time, but it doesn't have to be the same two to three topics at a time, if that makes sense. So to give you an example... In month one, let's say if you're doing one, if you're doing 50 videos a year or something like that, well, actually, like, no, let's keep it simple. Let's say you're doing like roughly 100 videos a year. And let's say you're going to do eight videos in month one. Let's say you're going to do eight videos in month one. In month one, your eight videos could be some combination of topics A, B, and C. And then in month two, it could be some combination of video topics A, D, and E. Okay. And then in month three, it could be video topics B, C, and D. And then in month four, it could be video topics C, D, and E. Do you follow? So you can have 
these five topics that authors care about. And you could focus on three of them at a time, but you don't have to make it the same three at a time month to month. You can just use a rotation system. I hope that makes sense the way I said it. Tawana Yvette says, the case I was reporting on has ended and I have to change my content. How do I change my content without damaging my channel? Um, well, for one thing, you can um, take YouTube shorts from highlights of the case because people still care about these things even after they're over. And then number two, just cover another case that's high profile. Cover another case that's high profile that a lot of people are interested in and just go with that. That would be what I would uh, suggest. That's probably your uh, best bet. Uh, and we're going to start to wrap up here in a bit. Whew. I need that. Opinion on marking your channel outside of YouTube from zero subs. Thoughts on making search and browse based content from zero subs. Yeah, make, just make search and browse content. So here's the strategy. Like everyone is too intimidated by having zero subscribers and they're, and they're being scared. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. Everything, everyone starts at zero. Like no one cares how many subscribers you have. They care about content. No one cares about how many subscribers you have. They care about content. And I'll let you in on a secret. YouTube's system doesn't give a crap about your subscribers because it doesn't even show your videos to them. It shows people videos based on their previous watch history and their preferences and what videos that are likely to click on. It does not care if you're subscribed to a channel. It doesn't care if you're subscribed to a channel. YouTube doesn't give a damn about your subscriber counts. And it doesn't give a damn about who subscribed or didn't subscribe to your channel. Yes, I said it. The quiet part out loud. YouTube does not care. Subscribers are a metric that is a public show of support. And they are also a status symbol. And they also are a bookmarking system. Having a subscribed channel is just a bookmark. And it's a public display of support. And it also says, I, I'm supporting this creator and I want their status to be elevated for people to see how many people support them. It shouldn't be called subscribers because it has nothing to do with distribution. It has nothing to do with distribution. The functional mechanism for distributing your videos to subscribers outside of the feed that nobody except OG people use stopped being meaningful in roughly 2013. It has not mattered what channel you're subscribed to since roughly 2013, 2015 at the latest. So don't worry about, oh, I don't have any subscribers. If you're starting from zero, what you should do is you should make the most interesting videos someone could watch about the subject matter that you can think of if they're at least entry level to the subject matter. And you should launch the channel with maybe five of those videos at once maybe five to eight of those videos at once. So there's something binge worthy to watch because until there is at least eight videos of the same subject matter, there's not really anything to subscribe for because it takes people three to five videos at a minimum to subscribe to a channel and you don't know which discover and what entry point they'll take, but you have to also promote the videos to each other in a way that makes sense and make it so that they have entry level content, what I call gateway content. So how do you launch a YouTube channel from zero? You start with five to eight pieces of gateway content that can be watched in any order that all of the same audience would care about. You make it with the best thumbnail possible for a stranger who will care about the topic on the YouTube homepage. And you use a compelling title that still has keywords in it 
maybe targeting all the same keyword for those first couple of videos that could then show up in either searched videos or suggested other videos for the same subject matter, or the videos could be suggested against each other. The videos that you're launching with are going to be suggested against each other so that if they watch one video, then they'll watch the next video or the other videos, or they'll binge watch. So the entire goal, I'll make a video about how to start a YouTube channel from zero subscribers. So the entire goal is to launch with a series of videos that doesn't have to be watched in any order, a series of five to eight videos for the same group of people that they can all watch without any order mattering, all with high quality thumbnails. If it isn't a four out of five or a five out of five thumbnail, do not publish it until it is. Make the better thumbnail. And if you want, like, what's a five out of five thumbnail? Find a thumbnail, multiple thumbnails of the similar quality that all have 100,000 plus views for the same idea that you want to talk about because you probably don't have an original idea. No one has an original idea. And find something with 100,000 to a million views. That's a four out of five or a five out of five thumbnail typically. Okay. Make all your thumbnails equal or greater quality and don't publish until it is. Don't publish a one out of five thumbnail, a two out of five thumbnail, or a three out of five thumbnail. If it is not a four out of five or five out of five thumbnail, do not publish the video until it is. And have one or two backups for swapping out the thumbnail. And yes, I'm being that serious. If you're serious about this, if you really care about I don't have any subscribers, this is your answer. Okay. So like how you show up matters. Dress for the job you want. Dress for the job you want. How you show up matters. So if you don't dress your thumbnail up for the job you want, don't complain about not getting hired, right? So dress for the job you want, okay? Impress the viewer, even as a small YouTuber. They don't care about how many subscribers they have. What they will care about is, damn, this person with no subscribers is coming out here swinging on day one. They will care about that. So it's about how you show up. Make multiple videos. If you can, five to eight videos to launch the channel so there's something to binge watch because even if you have to take a week off or something after that or even two weeks you have a lot of content there for people to be able to watch and enjoy and so and then you have nothing to lose because there's no notification system because you have no subscribers so it doesn't matter so there's not a downside now and so early on even hitting up multiple videos a week and everything there's no subscriber burn because there's no subscribers there's no oh i'm doing too much because there's no audience if it's evergreen content that can be watched at any time it's not something that, oh, this is dead in a week because the story doesn't matter. The thing doesn't matter in a week and everything. So no, no trends, no trends. It has to be stuff that will matter a year from now so that you can milk views indefinitely. And then you um, hit up more content like that. The other thing is if you do five to eight videos for a similar um, topic, when you do your next couple of videos, you can make videos for the same group of people, but it doesn't have to match exactly what you just did because now you don't have to worry as much about being bored. You move on to another mini series, but for the same people, but for the same people and you do that. No, I don't think you need to market your channel outside of YouTube. The best marketing for your channel is your YouTube channel. There are advantages. If you blow up, or if you're big in TikTok or Instagram, use that. But if you're not big in TikTok and Instagram, it doesn't matter. You don't need to market outside of YouTube, YouTube. YouTube will do the work if you make content people actually want to watch. The problem with most of you is you do not make content people want to watch. You make content to express yourself. You do not make what people want to watch. You do not have a target audience. You do not have clarity. You don't have a vision for the audience. You don't have a purpose for the channel. You are making things in an experimental way and have nothing wrong with experimental or expression. What I have a problem with is when you're experimenting and expressing yourself and expecting something. Experiments and expression are supposed to be something you can be okay with getting zero result out of or don't do it. If you cannot do something with zero coming back to you and feel good about it, then you should be ruthless and you should do something that is designed to get a return. But if you want to express yourself and you want to experiment, your expectations should be zero. I'm not saying it will be zero. I'm saying you should expect zero. You should have no emotional attachment to the outcome if you're truly wanting to express yourself or experiment. The curiosity and the experience is your reward and you should expect nothing else from it and you should be emotionally divorced and detached from it. 
if you want to do something to get results, be ruthless. If you want ROI, be ruthless. And in being ruthless, what I mean is you are being about, I will do what works. I will serve the audience. I will put what they want first. And it's not about me purely expressing myself as a number one or number two priority. It's number three. Pleasing myself is a number three priority at best. That's what being a career creator is like. Being a career creator is that the highest priority satisfying yourself is, is number three. It's the number three because number one is satisfying the audience. Number two is making this practical, sustainable, and profitable. And then number three is maybe I satisfied some personal victory out of doing it. Usually for a lot of people, that's emotional satisfaction or it's ego or recognition. Um, but I think the most important thing is to serve the audience and then to be able to make it financially viable is the second thing. If you have to be responsible as an adult, you have to be financially viable in the things that you do as a responsible adult who's taking time away from their other priorities or their other relationships. You have to do that from my point of view. If you're very, very young and you're single and you have no responsibilities, maybe you don't have to be practical and you can just be passionate. But I think if you're an adult, you have to be practical. And I think you have to be profitable and you have to be purpose-driven. And so um, I feel that you have to put the audience first. And so it has to serve the audience. So you have to be purpose-driven. And then I feel like you have to be profitable and practical. And then after that, I think you get to be passionate. But that's, that's a somewhat jaded perspective of somebody almost 40 when it comes to content creation. But the strategy, the strategy is you win on browse with the thumbnail. You win on suggested with the title and topic. And you win on search, largely predicated on the title and then SEO beyond that. Title and SEO is title, transcript. People don't believe it, but tags. It's topic, title, transcript, timeliness, tags, N not necessarily in that order, but I would say the order is probably topic and title, transcript, because then even the hook of the video, because they measure the first 30 seconds of a video, we know that because they also use the transcript to flag for demonetization and age gating. So we know the transcript matters. So if I was going to order it, it's probably topic, title, transcript. I would throw uh, timeliness in there as well. And at the bottom of that, keep tags keywords at the bottom of that but that's my thought on the strategy for the seo side and then for the home page aka browse it's topic title thumbnail timing obviously it's that it's about trying to score on best verticals on that suggested videos is largely going to be these have to be the same related thing topic and it parses that by virtue of the title um to a lesser degree the timeliness things like that. So it's very similar to search for suggested. So you still have to be optimized. So those things. Um, and again, it doesn't matter if you have zero subscribers. What matters is because no one cares. What people care about is the content that they like, which means they care about the topic that relates to them, the title that validates them, and then the content offering them value. I'm just going to um, answer the remaining super chats and then um, probably wrap this up. Um, Kate Caden says, question, I'm a YouTuber and I still have a full-time job. I'm committed to um, one video a week. Do you think one can be enough per week? I'm around 42K subscribers. Congratulations. And I've been at it since 2019. Okay. So my thought is um, if you can become more efficient and if you can batch record, if you can batch record, if you can go to two videos a week, you will probably get to 100,000 subscribers in one to two more years if you can double the amount of content. Um, I think that you have to be able to double the amount of content without a drastic drop in quality. If you can maintain 80% of the quality, if you can maintain 80% of the quality, but double the output, you will grow two to three times faster, which means you could probably be at um, 100K subs by 2025 if that's something that you would want to do which may put you in a position to go full-time.
Um, Javon, in terms of this question, in terms of um, fueling your vehicle, which means profit, which is more practical, gaming oriented content or film or animated content, neither, none of them. Do you know why? Copyright claims, copyright claims and copyright strikes. It's too vulnerable for me to say it's even practical to do it in terms of that. In terms of that, I don't even think it's practical because of the copyright claims and the copyright strikes, to be honest with you. Out of all of them, maybe anime, maybe. That's a big maybe. But you'd have to basically get a property that's not Toei or Suecia that's still popular and go that. Um, maybe if you go with, uh, God, what is it? Maybe if you go with... Um, Megutsu Tensei, uh, Jobless Re Reincarnation, because that's massively popular and has a bunch of lore and is not getting claimed. Or maybe with gaming, if you go with the Final Fantasy franchise or you go with GTA or you go with Minecraft because it's not getting copyright claimed. So the only way I think that that's even remotely practical or viable is if you go with a property that is historically not copyright claimed and not copyright striked, that is still wildly popular. That's the only way I could even say that it's practical is if you can take copyright off of the table entirely. Speaks with speak English with this guy. Thank you for the super chat. I have 400 K on Insta 90 K on Facebook. Congratulations. And 15 K on YouTube. How would you move the right people over to YouTube? I, um, I don't strongly believe I think it's harder to grow YouTube with other platforms than to grow other platforms with YouTube. I think the days of Vine and TikTok blowing up channels, aside from TikTok maybe, I think that like the, the days of those helping you grow your YouTube channel are far behind us because I think it's very difficult. And I think the people who even come over and they subscribe, I don't feel like they watch, right? I feel like they like the experience that they have. Some of them will support you. It'll be like 1% of the audience that support that moves over. It'll be like 1%, 10%. And that's better than nothing. And it would probably double your numbers if it's 1% to 10% of the people. But I just think it's really hard. You can literally just ask them. Like if I had 400 on Insta, I would ask maybe once or twice a week for a month for people to support me on YouTube and see what happens. But I don't even think that will do as much or do anything. Because all you can do is ask them. All you can do is ask them and they'll either support you on YouTube like you're asking or they won't. All you can do is ask them. And I'm just very jaded about whether or not people come through on an ask like that in high enough numbers and then actually show up for you after that, after that, to make it worthwhile versus if you grew those organically, I would just grow YouTube organically. I would argue that if you have 400K on Insta, it's probably because you made it more of a priority. Same thing for Facebook. And if you'd have to just put more time into the YouTube grind and in the YouTube system, uh, because the, the issue that I have is it is very hard to get people to cross platforms. It is very hard. It is damn near impossible to get people to cross over from supporting you on one platform to supporting you on another platform. It just is. Um, and people are very reluctant to do it. And even if they do it with a follow or a subscribe, they don't show up for you, most of them. So you're going to get 1% to 10% of these people to do it, run your numbers up, and then out of that 1% to 10%, a fraction of that will then actually show up for you. So... I don't know that it really, I, I don't like to be negative. I'm just saying that that's what I've seen, not just for me, for like everybody. And I think the best route is to grow individual platforms organically. I think it's growing into, like I grew my Twitter to 75K, 78K, whatever it's at. I grew that organically. Uh, I didn't shout it out that much on YouTube. I grew that organically. I grew my 23K on Instagram organically. Oh, wow. I'm so behind on Super Chats. Uh... Saffron Sage says, it, how, how would you do an astrology channel where much of the competition is doing reports on uh, 
transits that expire weekly or monthly. I'd make evergreen content on astrology. I would teach people things about, I would do beginner's guides for astrology that teach people. So that now I capture all the people who want to learn about astrology. I capture all the people that want to learn about it. So that's one. Then two, I'd probably make some evergreen astrology content about, um, about celebrities. I would ba make, um, videos about like um if you have this sign you have five celebrities that are I'd, I'd have like i'd have evergreen videos five celebrities that are virgos like the star signs of the 10 richest people in the world i would do that and that's evergreen content i would do formats like that and then I can beat those people. I could still do the weekly or monthly reports, but it's like if I have like the star signs of the 10 richest people in the world, that's a big deal. If I have the star signs of like where it's like, okay, like these five celebrities are Virgos. These eight celebrities are Virgos. These 10 celebrities are Geminis. Like people will watch that crap. Like they really will. They will easily like easily junk food they'll just do it so live modern dating thank you for the ten dollar super chat i've made fifteen thousand on youtube and got monetized in five weeks thanks to your content that's a big deal thank you we need more people of color in this sector thank you for representing thank you i appreciate you that's a big deal. Getting that far and doing that in like um, a couple of weeks is huge. So congratulations to you. You're doing something right. And I'm just glad that I could help. Um, Eddie um, 04 TV says, Roberta Blake, if you could advise one thing from your channel to get to the next level, what would it be? I would watch the video I said on use this strategy to grow on YouTube in 2023 advice for new YouTubers. It's the one that has the thumbnail that says zero to 50 K. If anything, I would watch that channel uh, video, that video from the channel. Um, and if anything, I would focus a lot more on the topic title thumbnail and timing. Like I would, I would say that that is the, content quadrant i'm marketing that by the way maybe i'll call it the creator quadrant or the content quadrant, but it's like but that's the answer is it is topic so that's topic what does the audience care about what do they care about right now what do they always care about what will they always care about okay it's like great and i was like timing is this evergreen is this trending right now is this trending for a season like what, what what's the timing title how do i write a good title Title cannot be boring, has to be impactful. And then thumbnail. Thumbnail has to pass the vibe check. Visually interesting, informs through storytelling in the thumbnail, is bold, and is eye-catching. Pass the vibe check. So topic, timing, thumbnail, topic, title, thumbnail, timing. Topic, title, thumbnail, timing. Every time. Every time. If you're going to focus on anything, that is what you focus on. And beyond that, then the, co the content of the quality has to be good audio, good video, good lighting, and they have to performance, personality, production. Then beyond that, you just need a good content strategy to where you can deliver on those things 100 times a year and all will be well. So if I can master topic, title, thumbnail, and timing and like figure out how to do that effectively, and then I can have Good performance on camera, so I don't suck on camera. Uh, my personality matches the audience, and I'm emotionally uh, empathizing with them, validating them, and offering them value. And so I'm doing that. That's personality. My production, good lights, good camera, good audio, and good um, editing. Okay, great. And then in terms of performance, I'm good on camera. There's good storytelling. There's good structure, good hooks, good hooks, good meat in the content and good call to action. It's like, if I can do those things, good storytelling. So if I can you know, present well, and I'm effective in storytelling and pacing, it's like, okay. So if I do an, all of those things, which means 
I can get the clicks. I can get retention and, and watch time. And then on top of all of that, I'm effective at content strategy, which means I now know how to make 50 to 100 good pieces of content where I've got good production performance and personality and I've done topic title and thumbnail correctly. If I can do that 50 to 100 times every year, my channel will grow. That's what it is. That like uh, that like so it's literally down to the clarity of the channel and its value proposition up front. So it's value for the viewer, it's value for the viewer up front in terms of that quality of what they get to watch and then quantity of an effective content strategy. That's why it is value first and then it's quality and it's quantity. It's like, okay, I make a video that's valuable. I understand my audience value first clarity. Got it. Then it's quality, the experience that they have. Great. And now I have an effective strategy that scales that with quantity of, I made more of the thing they like and the way they like it. If you can do that, then all will be well. And that, and then the only other thing anyone has to figure out is doing that and not starving to death. And once you can get those things right, I'll structure that in an outline somewhere. But if you can, and maybe in the description of the video later when I'm done, but if you can get those things right, if you can get those things right, those are like the main things. So that's like kind of like, it's four things and there's like three, three to four focuses among those four things, Right. So this is about a 15 section outline, so to speak. Like, you know, it's a 15 section outline because, you know, it's value for the viewers. What will help with the entry level point of, okay, views and crap they're interested in knowing what to, what to make for them and how to package it and how to present it. Then they have to have the experience. Okay. And they like that. They enjoyed that. Okay. And now I need an effective way to make more of what they a great, great. And now I need a way to not starve while doing this and how to have a business model behind it, how to monetize it properly. So it's like, so it's a very specific grouping of things. And as long as anyone can do that, their channel can be successful. That is like, that is the, that is the ultimately, that is the, that is the thesis of building a successful YouTube channel is audience clarity through distilling down the value for the viewer and then demonstrating that value to the viewer up front through our four T's of topic title and thumbnail. Then it's delivering a quality experience for the viewer through our performance on camera, which is like our overall performance and presentation, our storytelling and our pacing production quality through video lights audio and editing and then our personality in terms of our capacity to empathize with the viewer validate the viewer and then offer value to the viewer and that's what that comes down to and then we have to beyond all of that come up with a content strategy where we're able to extrapolate this through some combination of 25 50 to 100 videos a year uh you know where we've done this effectively in a meaningful way and then we have to make it all profitable and as long as we can do and that's a lot to do but if we can do all those things if we do all those things there's no reason we don't have a successful youtube channel if you can do all those things which is a lot there's no reason to not have a successful youtube channel Chris James, $20 super chat. I learned so much from this last year being full-time YouTuber than the 10 years before it. Uh, yeah, big testament there. Uh, I hear you. I've been uh, doing YouTube for 2.5 years. Where are the top three editing things I must learn? Um, biggest editing things probably in terms of generally for everybody from a quality standpoint, um, audio correction, color correction and color grading, and when and how to cut. That'd be the technical aspect of it. Um, beyond that, learning how to properly pace a video learning how to edit the front part of a video for stronger hooks and retention at the beginning of the video, maintaining the energy uh, throughout the video, 
and being able to close the video effectively, I would tell people use the sandwich method or the bookend method, which is edit the first minute of the video aggressively and edit the last minute of the video aggressively before you edit the middle of the video. But that's after you've already done your uh, rough cut. So you do your rough cut. So all the mistakes and all the dead air and everything and the video is structured um, properly. And then once the rough cut is done to where, okay, this is the core of the video, then you edit the first 30 to 60 seconds of the video aggressively. And then the last 60 seconds of the video aggressively. And so before you run out of steam and energy, the video has a strong ending and a strong beginning. So the bookends are done or the sandwich is done. And now the meat of the video is where your effort will be and you'll have to maintain energy, but at least, you know, you have a strong start and a strong finish. So then uh, you can work on the middle. So that would be my editing advice. Yeah. Um, to someone's point, I don't believe viral videos are luck. I think all viral videos today are money. All viral videos today are, are money. They're not luck. I, that's why I don't like them and I don't believe in them because they're, they're not luck. They're money. <laughs> Viral videos today are manufactured by money printing. $5 super chat from uh, Tana So Lit. Um, good to see you, bro. Great stream. Thank you. <clears throat> so, yeah. So, yeah, no, I don't believe that viral videos are... I do not believe that viral videos are luck or lottery tickets as much as I believe viral videos are manufactured by virtue of um, throwing money at them now. Um, that's my experience with viral videos. My exception to that rule is YouTube. Oh, excuse me. YouTube shorts. It's YouTube shorts. Um, Chloe says I do tutorials and I get 940 watch hours growing sub is, do you have advice for increasing this to build a community? I'd need to know more about the channel, Chloe. Um, I need to know more context. I need to know a lot more to be able to give anything specific. That's probably, to be honest with you, it's more of a one-on-one -on -one coaching um, thing. Mist, uh, girl, Misty Girl says, I'm surprised at how few aspiring content creators seek out this information from Roberto, Andrew Can, Nick Nimmin, Think Media, VidIQ, Nate from Channel Makers, and Film Booth. Yeah, um, what it is is a lot of people are skeptical of... A lot, of, a lot of small YouTubers, in particular new YouTubers, they're skeptical because they think, oh, this is all just a scheme to sell me courses or this or that. And it's like, when that's stupid, because if you believe that, you could just take all the free information and just say, oh, okay, ha, 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 I'm going to take all your free information. I'm not going to buy your course. It's like, because then just not watching the content or not believing any of it because you believe it's all designed to, to, to sell a course is stupid because your own viewers, your own viewers, it's like, you know what? You made a video because you want to make ad revenue. You made a video because you want to get sponsors. You made a video because you want to get status. You want subscribers. You want to be a big YouTuber. You want literally a trophy, right? So the thing is, there's no altruism in making videos. That's ridiculous. There's no, no. And by that, I mean, there's no 100% altruism. There is no such thing as 100% altruism in making videos unless you are literally a child or you're someone who refused to grow the hell up. There's no 100% altruism in anything after you're 18 years old unless you are a child, an idiot, or immature as hell. There's not – no, it does not exist. Or unless you were born rich and you don't have to care or you're taken care of and you don't have to care. There is no such thing as 100% altruism over 18 years old. Or if there is, and you're being 100% altruistic after you're 18 years old, you should probably be locked in a padded cell because you have something wrong with you because you will not survive this world if you are if you have that mentality and you're not rich. There's no realism to it. I'm being hyperbolic, but I'm saying it's so unrealistic. But the reason that a lot of small and new content creators, they have, they're in a lot of communities, a lot of them are on Reddit, and they're mad jaded because they think everything that might have an upsell or a marketing angle or anyone who does anything for money 
is skeezy or a scumbag in their opinion because the younger generation, especially content creators, have been sold a scam called Utopia where they believe because they get on the internet and everything on the internet is free, they believe that's how the entire world can and should operate because they don't realize that the internet isn't free. The internet is subsidized through a lot of different monetization schemas that they don't understand and that they're the product and that they're the product. So they don't understand that all the free crap, this generation grew up with all this free crap and doesn't realize that because it's free that they're the product. They don't realize that they haven't escaped capitalism and that they should get over it. Um, and so they have these wacky ideas that anyone who tries to sell anything or make money is automatically a scumbag instead of literally just determine whether something's a good product or not. Or if you're so skeptical, there's a real simple answer to never being scammed in your life. Don't buy anything that's not from a billionaire. If you literally refuse to never buy anything that doesn't come from a mega conglomerate, a billionaire corporation, how are you ever going to get scammed? But then you just don't complain about capitalism. You never complain about the world. You never complain about competition, small business owners, any of those things. If you, and again, this is not directed at you. This is directed again, this like the, this mentality of a type of person, right? Is that if you believe all of those things, if you like are like just so desperate to never be scammed in your life, your answer is to lock into the institutions forever. Your, in, your answer to that, and I'm being dead serious, your answer to that is only buy from vetted corporations, publicly traded companies, and institutions, and billionaires for the rest of your life, and you will never be scammed. You will never be scammed if you only buy from product companies that are household names and publicly traded companies for the most part. And, and every one of them has like a return policy. So there's very little chance that you'll be scammed in the conventional sense of being scammed in the conventional sense. That's not a guarantee that you'll get value. That's not a guarantee you'll get your money's worth, but you will never have to feel like there was a con artist or a scammer or something like that. If you just lock in to the institutions and the conglomerates and align with them and ally with them for the rest of your life, you'll never have to worry about it. And then when you consume content, you can consume free content without worry because all you have to do is never buy a course. If you if you consume free content, what's the downside of watching Think Media, Nick Nimmin, or Nate, or me, or whoever? If you never buy a course, if you never hire a coach, if you never decide to click on a product link for the rest of your life, how are you going to get scammed? Just benefit from the free content if you're so worried about it, and you can just live in this fairy utopia where nobody ever... Uh, buys like anything and nobody participates in capitalism while praying to also extract from capitalism through your ad revenue while also extracting from it when you want to get a brand deal and a sponsorship. Like it's the most insane thing to me, right? The people who um, don't believe in paid content also believe in being paid for their content at the same time. And so that's my issue with that mentality. And so, yes, I know exactly why more people don't seek it out is they don't believe in it because they, um, they feel like if it extracts value in any other way than their own approved way, which is, well, you get ads, but people use ad block or will you get sponsors, but not everyone does get sponsors and everyone takes them or they don't pay as well as you think sometimes or whatever. And some people have employees. If you sell anything, you're not trusted. That's why people don't pursue this knowledge, because if you sell anything, you're not trusted. So what they would rather do instead, by the way, is listen to advice from Ironically, they'd rather hear it come from a big content creator that in all likelihood never actually had to go through multiple, multiple, multiple years of being working class before being a content creator. Because like people who are that big typically didn't have like 10 years of working for other people, right? It was at a minimum, maybe five for some of them, but barely that because most of the big content creators, super young, super young. So it's not like they had like five, 10 years of being a retail worker or a server or doing an office job. So like in the reality, the person, there's a massive class difference. And I'm not saying they can't teach you because of that massive class difference. I'm saying that by the time that happens, there is a level of where their advice may not actually be applicable. It just sounds good because it's like, well, I'm hearing it from the YouTuber that I love to watch and that makes the content that I wish I could make. So I just take their, but it's like, but it's not always really great advice sometimes because it doesn't take into account time freedom and the lack of it, investment capital and the lack of it, manpower and the lack of it, efficiency and effectiveness and the lack of it. And again, that's where my issue is that I do not think most advice that exists applies to working class content creators. I definitely think most of the advice is also geared toward young people who don't have responsibility and like don't have families 
don't ha- um, take care of elderly parents, don't work a 50 hours a week job. Like, I don't think that most advice about content creation or YouTube exist for like the majority of working class content creators, which is the majority of content creators at large, at least the ones over 18. Like, so I, I ironically feel that the hesitancy is that they feel like the course people or the YouTube educator community, they feel ironically like we sell the dream or a pipe dream when ironically, like we're probably selling the more realistic version of it because most of the people we deal with are not like dreamers. They're not people under 25. Most of the people we deal with are over 25. Um, most of my clients are over 25, over 30, 35. Most of them are not broke because they think that we also take advantage of broke people. Like with the prices we charge, broke people can't participate in anything but our free content or buy like a book. So like there's not really a way at a certain price point to take advantage of broke people because I remember being broke and being broke meant I didn't have $500. <laughs> so like I didn't have, cause like, I think there's this new version of being broke where you can actually be broke and also have like a $500 gaming console. That was not my version of broke. My version of broke was actually my version of broke was like not having gas money. My version of broke wasn't, oh, I'm going to buy a $500 course. My version of broke is I don't have gas money. <laughs> so like, I don't know what this new generation's version of being broke is or new definition of being broke is. Cause like I, I, last time I checked, you, you can't be broke and buy a $500 course. That doesn't compute for me. So I don't know how you can take advantage of broke people selling courses. I don't know. I don't understand that. Maybe I just don't understand the culture because I do not believe you can simultaneously be broke and afford a $500 course because that was not my lived experience of being broke. <laughs> my lived experience of being broke was borrowing lunch money, even as an adult. That was my, my um, lived experience of being broke is going to the pawn shop and pawning things. So I don't understand buying. Um, I do not understand um, buying online courses and being broke. It just doesn't compute for me personally. But I do think that that's the skepticism. And I think that's the pushback or the lack of believing in YouTube educators is because I think um, they believe that the big creators are more ethical because they don't sell anything except for merch or something. Hey, bro, I just want to say it's been amazing as always. Thank you for dropping gems. Thank you, KMH family. Appreciate you. Blessed or messy says, even if we didn't have eight people on our team, we can't do what you do with one person. Oh, I appreciate that. That's actually hard. But that for me, I think I owe that to my corporate background, to be honest with you. Um, I owe that, I think, to my corporate background because I was doing like eight jobs for like one paycheck, to be honest with you. I, I mean, which so sucks. It sucks. Believe me, it sucks. But I think that the deadlines, the pressure and not knowing any better and saying yes all the time to that stuff. Like, I think that made me uh, absurdly efficient. Um, yes. I understand that if you put those hours in it, but that's a maybe if it brings, cause like a lot of those creators, it doesn't bring in a million dollars per se. Um, and not till much later. So um, with the quality over quantity thing, putting in those hours, it's really hard. And there's not like a guarantee. Um, so, yeah. Uh, let's see. I'm so behind. On, I'm just going to have to do super chats only because I have to close the stream here in about 15 minutes. Dorsey Hip Hop Jules, uh, thank you, says, what's the best way to use my Instagram account to promote your YouTube channel? So just post video links in Facebook. Group. I would do Instagram stories. I would do Instagram stories. I would maybe not Facebook groups and not Reddit forums because uh, they're against self-promotion. I would probably just do Instagram stories. Zach 
Xanadu with a $5 super chat. Tips on growing a channel after you've captured your niche. Looking into growing and into other topics and using shorts. Uh, I don't know about the other topics thing because I think that's a problem. I think if you want to grow because you've captured your niche is you need to look at onboarding and growing the niche, if anything. Also, I would still say you probably haven't hit market cap if you're not the biggest channel in your niche. So I would still make more videos on your topic, use YouTube shorts, and I would also look at what got you most subscribers. And I would make, like I'd find 10 videos that made you the most subscribers, then make five more videos of that same idea that got you the most subscribers. And then you could gradually, uh, drastically increase your numbers by doing that. Uh, I'll probably do a stream, if not a video. I need to do a video. I need to do a video on YouTube's uh, sub payouts. I need to, like, yeah. I need to do a video on YouTube's sub payouts because I think there is, like, a lot to talk about about that. Um, here's something from YouTube's creator liaison, Renee Ritchie. Everyone would do well to go into traffic sources and see how many people really click through sub feed or notifications versus homepage and search and prioritize accordingly. I couldn't agree more. That's the, like a big deal. Like the traffic sources thing, um, I could do an entire video and I probably should on traffic sources. I think that that's one of the most underlooked and important things in um, YouTube. Yep, I'm preaching and it's not even Sunday. <laughs> um, Shrell Moore, Tucker, your honesty with us working class content creators is golden. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. It's the, yeah. I think it's like the, I think it's one of the most important issues. I think it's one of the most important issues that is not talked about in the entire creator economy is the working class content creator, as well as then upgrading from being a working class content creator to being the creator middle class. And the creator middle class is when you start that entry level of, okay, I'm a full-time YouTuber, but being a full-time YouTuber could be that you're making 30, 40, 50, $60,000 a year as a YouTuber, content creator, TikToker, Instagrammer, some combination of podcaster, streamer, whatever, but you've gone all in. So it's like the beginnings of being a middle class content creator is, okay, I'm full-time, but then there's levels to that. And you can, um, you know, go up or down in that, but the working class content creator still works a job and does content creation. And then the creator middle class is when you begin to be a full-time content creator. You haven't made it yet because you're not rich, but you are in the middle class because you have the ability to be a full-time content creator, but you could be in the middle class, but you could be lower middle class. If you're making 30 to, if you're making 30 to $60,000 a year, you're in the creator middle class, but after taxes, you're in the lower middle class of the creator middle class, okay? And then it goes up from there. Again, it's worse if you're in New York or California, mind you. So it's things like that. It's things like that. And I think it's not um, talked about. And I don't think it's broken down for people. Like, it really matters. Um, Nobu says, thank you for the value you always deliver on these lives. Appreciate you. I'll probably go live again tomorrow. I'll probably go live again tomorrow. Kind of filling in for Nick Nimmin today. Value, quality, strategy. Got it. Yep, that's what you got to do. Um, that's what you do. Yeah. I, yeah, the reason, like I said, the reason I don't like viral videos is because I believe that in the current generation of viral videos, they are all manufactured by throwing money at them. And I think that organic viral videos outside of YouTube shorts and TikTok are rare, but I also think that those are the companies to some extent uh, picking and choosing um, sometimes what goes viral. Uh, what AI tools are good to start and grow a channel? Uh, Chat GPT for topics and titles and mid journey for thumbnails. Uh, mid journey for thumbnails, Chat GPT for topics and titles. Uh, TubeBuddy and vidIQ sometimes understand trends and timing because those have real-time data. So uh, for timing, yes. I 
Uh, what would you do if you are looking at your channel and think I'm not cool enough to grow an audience? Work on confidence, work on charisma, um, work on topic title, thumbnail and timing, and then also look at a channel, look at a channel that is succeeding in your niche, close the gap between what you have in terms of presentation, if nothing else in them. So like, Again, dress for success is like probably one of the best things that you could do, even on a channel level, is dress for success just for the job you want. Look like a big YouTuber in terms of the aesthetic, in terms of topic, title, thumbnail, timing, uh, banner, um, general aesthetic, lighting, video quality, editing quality, presentation, voice training, charisma, scripting. Uh, Jenny Lay says, Roberta told me two weeks ago to work on my thumbnails, and I did. Numbers doubled. Yeah, congratulations. Listen to his advice. It's worth it. Absolutely. We're going to wrap up here soon. We're wrapping up with the Super Chats. <clears throat> let's see faith says i want to make a youtube channel that i don't have to show my face can you give me some channel ideas please i mean faceless channels exist for everything it depends on what you're good at what you're passionate about what you're good at what there's an audience for there are all kinds of faceless channels a lot of gaming channels are faceless channels a lot of tv and television show look if i was going to make a faceless channel i probably make a faceless channel right now around star wars game of thrones or harry potter um those are like probably the three biggest franchises in the world um like in terms of fandom right now so those are ideas you can make a faceless channel that um covers news if you want to go into news and politics you can make a faceless channel about roughly anything at this point um you can make a faceless channel that's creepy pastas where you tell scary stories um that would be another one that i could probably say that oh yeah that'd be fun to go into because that's fun and you don't have to upload as often so yeah my boy reezy resells how's it going mike um Reezy says, man, man, live for four hours for a Sith. It's pretty heroic. Yep. Yep. We got to be out here repping the dark side. Would you ever do a collaboration with a small YouTuber under a thousand? I have, but the thing is that's not valuable to my audience for the most part. That's like, so the issue is not about like, oh, do I think a small YouTuber deserves it or anything like that? No, it's about a small YouTuber with 1,000 subscribers typically, typically can't do something for my viewers. They can't do something. I'm only interested in collaborations that actually serve my audience. That's what I keep talking about. Like the only thing that happens from interviewing a small YouTuber is theoretically that small YouTuber theoretically might and probably won't get some subscribers out of it. So it's really great for a small YouTuber under a thousand. My audience gets nothing out of the exchange. I get views. Maybe, maybe I get views. Maybe I get ad revenue. Maybe it looks altruistic or charitable on my part. Maybe it makes me look very relatable and not like a snob. And my viewers get absolutely nothing because there's not something that is more interesting that I can do um, by collaborating with a YouTuber under a thousand subscribers that my audience can get value from versus me interviewing a YouTuber with 20, 30, 50,000 subscribers that broke through that has something to give to the experience that they're going through. So go, given my audience's goals, given my audience's goals, the only way that that works is if the small YouTuber is also successful outside of YouTube in a massive way that would matter. So a small YouTuber with less than a thousand subscribers, that's also a multimillionaire might have something to contribute to my audience. A small YouTuber with less than a thousand subscribers, but works with one of the brands in the creator economy, that would actually make sense for my audience. But there's not much that um, a small YouTuber with less than a thousand subscribers per se can do for my audience. A YouTuber with 10,000 subscribers could do something for my audience because there's an experience that they could um, speak to. There's an experience that they could speak to that really would relate to my audience and that a lot of people haven't gotten to 10,000, 90% of creators haven't gotten to 10,000 subscribers. So that would do it. 
a YouTuber who got to a thousand subscribers and just got monetized and went through the partner program application process, they could do something for my audience because they can speak to the application process and what it was like to just get a channel monetized and pass that process. So that is, that's something where someone could offer it. This is the last super chat. And then we are literally wrapping up because we're about to hit four exactly. And LinkedIn only does four hours on the stream too. So if nothing else, we'll have to close out LinkedIn. Marcel Hyde says, I'm six months in and not seeing any channel growth. I'm in the self-help inspirational space. Best advice to grow this channel in this niche. Um, I'm going to answer this, but we're going to have to close out for um, LinkedIn audience because LinkedIn can only go to um, four hours um, of stream time, believe it or not. So sorry for the LinkedIn audience. You're going to have to watch on YouTube um, to get the rest of this. Um, I think I can end the broadcast only for LinkedIn people. No, nope, I can't. Okay, I'm going to have to answer this in a minute and close out. I actually gave advice for the self-help niche, but what you need to do is you need to specifically find a problem to solve for a specific group of people. You cannot just be this broad, inspirational self-help space not to start and grow. You've tried that for six months and it hasn't worked. Focus on a group of people. Find the best video that you've done that's done anything at all. Find the five best videos you've ever done capitalize and say, I will go hard on those things and make more videos about those things specifically. Make the best thumbnail that has ever been made for those topics. Make a stronger title and not a generic title, maybe something triggering or aggressive or controversial for those topics to get people's interest and then try that and see what happens um, is what you need to do. But solve a specific problem or group of pro grouping of problems for a specific group of people. So that'd be my advice. I want to thank everybody for the stream and for showing up. I want to thank everybody who super chatted. Uh, we'll probably do this again uh, tomorrow and Sunday. I'm going to try to add timestamps later in the week. Thank you to everybody. Remember that you can grab my book. Link is in the description down below. Stay awesome, and I will catch you next time, everybody. Take care.